principles of pharmacology. We're going to blast through this. We'll spend a bunch of time on a few slides. We will and hopefully switch from the PowerPoint to my camera at a couple of appropriate times to make some points and for you to laugh at my artwork because I'm, I'm a terrible artist. All right. Medications are interventions. They can be very important interventions. They can be life-saving interventions. Uh, for instance, if you have a patient who has had a massive allergic reaction, your patient is allergic to bee stings and one of those little buzzing devils got them and bam, their immune system overreacts to it and they break out in hives and they start to itch all over the back of their throat, itches, and then they start feeling a tightness in their, in their throat and then pow, they, they lose consciousness, their, their blood pressure is extremely low. Why did that happen? Massive vasodilation. Uh, we'll, in a few slides, we'll talk about something called the perfusion triangle. You need a functioning pump, the heart. You need intact pipes and properly functioning pipes. That would be arteries and veins, uh, more particularly arteries. And then we need the fluid to fill up the container, to fill up those pipes. That would be blood. So uh, our patient with anaphylaxis has massive vasodilation, still has a pump that works, still has, has blood, the same amount of blood for now, same amount of blood and but that the pipes just got too big, don't have enough liquid to fill it up. Uh, when you have a bigger pipe with less liquid, you have lower pressure. We need to do something to fix it. That's called an intervention. In this case, it would be epinephrine, which causes vasoconstriction. That is an intervention. That is a medication. It's life-saving. It's important. You're going to learn how to, how to like it, love it, use it, and save people's lives, and it's going to be really cool. May alleviate pain. Uh, that's a good thing. I don't like to hurt. Uh, some people do. That's a whole different story. Fifty Shades of Grey stuff. We're not going there. All right. Uh, they alleviate pain. We give medications to improve our patient's condition. Uh, that is that is the reason for medications in EMS. People have recreational meds away from EMS. We're not going to go there. We will briefly talk about some of those. The, uh, if we fail to administer medications safely, we can kill our patient. They can have dire consequences. We're going to learn how to safely administer medications. You will, as an EMT, administer medications. We administer medications based on doctor's orders. We don't go out there and practice medicine. We have standing orders. We have offline medical control protocols that tell us what medications we could administer, when we could administer, how much to administer, all of that. We're, we're not out there making this stuff up and just seeing how it turns out. It's not what we're about. We help at, and we may have a protocol or get a doctor's order that says we can't use that spring-loaded EpiPen to stab that anaphylactic patient in the leg for them to get that dose of epinephrine, but, and I mean, they're nervous, they're scared, uh, they think they're gonna die, but they have an EpiPen, and the doctor says, uh, no, you don't administer it, but you help get it ready for them to administer. That's self-administration, all right. Uh, and then after administering medications, we're gonna report the information about that administration to, to hospital personnel. What do I mean by that? What was going on with our patient? Uh, our assessment. Why do we need to administer the medication? That would be our patient's chief complaint and what we found as a life threat in our patient assessment. How much did we administer? How did the patient respond? to the administration of the medication, have we given repeat doses? 
That's the thing that we give sometimes a radio report about, followed by a verbal report when we transfer care of our patient in the emergency department or to an advanced life support crew that, that meets us on the way to the hospital to, to take the, the level of care from our basic life support as EMTs to advanced life support. Uh, we're gonna report off what medications we've given, and uh, how much, how the patient responded, and here you go. And then they will take it from there. So we will, we will get, and then we will write a detailed patient care report uh, listing all this because if it ain't written, it didn't happen, right? Uh, we have to document it. Documentation is the key. Uh, saving your patient is the goal. One of the keys to saving your patient in the end, it turns out as documentation. So you can demonstrate everything we're gonna talk about today. Science of drugs is pharmacology. You knew that before you came here. You knew that a medication is something that is used to treat disease, relieve pain, all of those things. The indication for using the medication, why we want to give it. Pharmacodynamics, probably a new word. That's a $2. EMS school word, that's a long one. Pharmaco, medications, pharmacology, science of drugs, dynamics, here that refers to how medications work in the body, on the body. Uh, we'll hit some details on that as we go. Uh, obviously, I'm not gonna become a pharmacist in EMT school, paramedic school, nursing school, uh, you go to pharmacy school to be a pharmacist. You take, in medical school, you have intense detail courses on pharmacology, and then in every course you take, I'm sure, in visiting with my doctor friends, that uh, you spend considerable time studying pharmacodynamics. And then, you, in medical school, you do, after you graduate, in order to go practice the discipline of medicine that you want to pursue, you do a residency and you get four, five, six, seven years of intense practice uh, under the watchful eye and the demanding brain and mouth of attending physicians who are experts in their field and do things called grand rounds where you have patients assigned to you and you're responsible for the care of that patient, the medications that are administered. And if you're giving a medication to your patient, you better know that thing inside and out because you will be grilled on it. And you're not just by yourself. There are, if, if you're in the hospital and you watch this happen, it's kind of fun for me to watch you have the attending physician, you have the residents, you have the medical students, and they're all moving around in a pack from patient to patient. And that attending physician is grilling those people who, who he or she is teaching. And I mean, down to the fine details about everything with the patient. That's how they learn. In EMS, we have a less intense, far shorter period of that and our preceptors, when you go hop on an ambulance here in a few weeks, hopefully, uh, oxygen is a drug. Uh, I expect there's a good chance your preceptor on the ambulance is going to ask you some questions about oxygen administration. And uh, it's, they're not gonna grill you in, a, in a, an intense fashion. Like what happens to medical students and medical residents, but they're going, going to use the, uh, your, uh, ad, your airway adjuncts and your oxygen delivery systems to ask you some questions. Or you may get one who's really tired and they don't even wanna talk. Don't take that personally. Hope you don't get that person. Let's talk about how medications work. In some cases, we want to use a medication that's an agonist. An agonist stimulates 
receptors in the body, an agonist plugs in to try to bring about a desired effect. Let's see if I can, oh man. Now this isn't going to work. Okay, I want you to, on a piece of paper in front of you, I want you to draw a heart, but I want you to leave a little notch cut out of it, just like a heart with a, with a little, like something took a bite out of it. Then I want you to draw a circle, but on the end of that circle, I want you to put like a bird's beak. And that bird's beak is designed to fit into that little notch in, in the heart to and that notch in the heart is a receptor and the little circle with the bird's beak plugs into that receptor to bring about the desired effect in when a patient has a drop in blood pressure uh, they're because they've lost blood. They're going into hypovolemic shock. The way the heart, the way the body compensates for that drop in perfusion because of that drop in blood pressure is to trigger the fight or flight mechanism in the body. So adrenaline is released from the adrenal glands. This adrenaline is like the epinephrine that we administer to patients. One of the things that adrenaline does or epinephrine is to bind to beta-1 receptor, receptors in the heart. So the, your beta drug, which would be your beta agonist, epinephrine with its little bird beak, goes and plugs into those receptors on the heart and that triggers a reaction or it stimulates that receptor. What happens with adrenaline or epinephrine? It triggers an increase in heart rate and it makes the heart muscle squeeze harder. What does that do? That increases cardiac output because the stroke volume goes up Remember what, where cardiac output comes from. It is the stroke volume, how many milliliters of blood are ejected from the heart in maximum systole, when that heart muscle squeezes, squeezes down, times the heart rate. So if we increase the rate with a beta-1 agonist and we increase the amount of squeeze the heart has, which is we, we increase the amount of squeeze to eject more blood with, with each time the heart experiences systole, we have increased cardiac output. We have, we have brought about a positive change in our patient or the adrenaline that our patient releases from their adrenal glands has improved their condition. That's how an agonist work works. Very simplistic explanation, but that you boil it all down. That's what it is. Stimulating a receptor. That's an agonist. That's that bird's beak fitting into the receptors in the heart. That's not how they look really, but it's easier to draw that picture. Okay. Now, uh, same situation. Uh, we need to get more air to the lungs. So, the beta-2 properties of that same adrenaline or epinephrine, remember you have two lungs, beta-1 heart, one heart, beta-1. We have two lungs, unless we had a surgical remover, removal of one. We have two lungs, so beta-2 acts, beta-2 properties act on the, on the smooth muscles of the bronchioles and that causes bronchodilation so we can with each inspiration more oxygenated air is delivered down 
through the airways and down to those alveolar sacs. So that's beta one, beta two. So that is how an agonist works. That is how receptors work. Okay, now, oh man, something bad is happening and we want to give a medication that binds to a receptor that blocks something from acting on part of the body. Same, same drawing, you have your little beta one circle with a bird's beak, you have your same heart with a little notch in it, so you have a receptor, and then you have that beta one property of that epinephrine, but we wanna block it. This person's heart rate is too fast, we need to slow it down, or our patient is eventually gonna, they're, they're already in distress, and, and eventually they overwork their heart muscle, they're gonna die. So we could give a beta blocker medication, and it could go occupy that receptor so that the beta one just bounces off because there's not, there's not an open place to dock. That's an antagonist. It binds to a receptor and blocks other medications or chemicals from acting in that area. All right. Decent enough word picture. Understand what we're talking about. Uh, that's an antagonist. It's a, it's a type of blocker. All right. Dose, that's the amount of medication we give. Uh, where do they come up with doses? They do lots of research. First they do animal research, then they do double blind uh, control studies uh, with different groups getting different amounts of medication or getting placebos and they do all their voodoo that you do with, with statistics and they decide eventually how much of a medication to give. Sometimes it's based on weight. We see that with a lot of drugs we use in ALS, in, in EMS, we give one, one milligram per kilogram of, of body weight. So things like that. Age, uh, children's Tylenol versus adult strength Tylenol. Tylenol, acetaminophen in high, super high doses is hepatotoxic. What does that mean? It damages the liver and eventually could kill the liver in high enough dosages. So through research, they've determined the maximum amount that can be, can be given to a child prior to causing hepatic damage. And that becomes, then you, you get a, you may even get a different strength. There are less milligrams per milliliter in children's liquid Tylenol than what you would have in an adult capsule or caplet that, that an adult would take. And then there's a maximum, a maximum daily dosage of acetaminophen, acetaminophen for adults also. Uh, we don't give, we don't give, well, at the EMT level, we don't give acetaminophen to our patients. That's just a good, a good place to, a good medication to give use for an example. Uh, we have a desired action. Uh, we don't want to overdose our patient. We don't want to underdose them. We want to give them the right amount of medication to bring about that desired action. So what is that action called? We have new terms, therapeutic effect. That is what our goal is to achieve the therapeutic effect by administering the proper amount of a medication, the proper proper medication, the proper amount to the patient. We're going to learn the the six R's of medication administration in, in a few slides. Really cool. Something that if I were you, I would I would learn. Not just for my exam, not just for the National Registry, but for the benefit of your patients. Indications. That's why we're using the dang stuff, right? Reasons or conditions that that bring about the patient's need for a medication. That is an indication. Medications also have harmful effects. Uh, just because 
our patient has a fungal infection in their nail in their toenails picture old thick gnarly yellow toenails with kind of some crusty white stuff on them oh those things are they're they're wonderful you just uh look like your patient has tolio they got this these funko nails and you'll see a lot of this in in our in our in the the wonderful field of medicine and somebody goes to the doctor and yes there is an oral medication that can be given to help address these old funky toenails that that have this fungal infection in the nail when our patient takes those those toenail peel toenail pills they don't just act that medication doesn't just act on the toenail that medication has a has systemic action all medications have some sort of systemic action that's not always good you see the dang commercials on tv that i uh, uh, do not take this drug if and then there's a laundry list of stuff which includes your dog's tail falling off and you know what your dog's tail will fall off so those are actually side effects that i'm going through those side effects could be bad enough that we cannot give this medication to that patient Let's switch from funky toenails to somebody with an infection who needs an antibiotic. Some of the best antibiotics we have are in our penicillins. There are multiple, multiple types of penicillin. There are people like me who are penicillin sensitive, penicillin allergic. I have a severe allergy to penicillin. I cannot have the stuff. So even though that would be a penicillin might be great to treat an infection I have, my severe allergy to it is an absolute contraindication to me receiving that medication. So that is absolute contraindication, a harmful effect that's so great that I can't receive it. Relative contraindication. Uh, let me think of something there to make a good point. Mm, pregnant women. Uh, last time I was pregnant, no. Uh, pregnant women cannot take very many medications because of the effect that they might have on that develop, developing fetus that that woman has growing in her uterus. And, I mean, that means things like you have bad allergies, uh, seasonal allergies, allergic, allergic rhinitis, runny nose, itchy eyes, watery eyes, all of that stuff. You can't take an antihistamine because of the effect it might have on that developing baby. But let's say this pregnant woman has cancer. They, they detect cancer while this woman is pregnant. And this is an aggressive cancer. And it has, metast it has metastasized, starting to spread throughout the body. It's aggressive. It is going to kill her, possibly, or reach the point of no return so that even if she is able to carry this baby to term and deliver a live healthy baby she may not live to see that baby take its first step see the baby grow up so the doctor says we really need to get started with chemotherapy we've got to stop this cancer it's going to kill you and i think it might kill you within four to six months if we don't administer this chemotherapy what's the first question what that's what's that going to do to my baby there are there's a strong chance of really harmful effects on your on your developing baby your baby could have horrible birth defects blah 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 but your risk the risk to your life 
is immediate and it is greater than what I believe the risk to your, your developing baby to be, I suggest we start the chemotherapy to save your life. Now we've demonstrated a relative contraindication. Uh, yes, there are harmful effects, but there's more benefit to you personally to move forward with this therapy. So that's a relative contraindication. All right, enough of that. Questions about a relative contraindication? I know you're still out there somewhere. No, sir. All right, cool. Side effects, unintended effects. Okay, back to the funky toenails. Uh, medications, they, they act systemically, like I said. And if you take the funky toenail fixing pills, it might make all the hair fall off the top of your head. That would be an unintended, unintended effect. That would be a side effect. No, let's, let's take the, let's have a less of a side effect than that. I keep seeing my bald head in the camera over here and it distracts me. I hope it doesn't distract you as much. I should wear a ball cap maybe. Okay. Unintended effects. Uh, drowsiness. Okay. Let's see. We, uh, back to the Benadryl for allergies. Uh, it works great on seasonal allergies. Uh, Benadryl is a histamine blocker. Back to those, those, those antagonists, those blocker type medications. We'll, we'll learn a lot more about this in a couple of weeks. But what is one of the side effects of Benadryl? It can make you drowsy. I can take 200 milligrams of Benadryl and I don't get tired. I never know that really that I've taken it other than it knocks the edge off my allergies. Some people take a 25 milligram over-the-counter strength tablet of Benadryl in their sleep for seven hours. That, that drowsiness is, is, it's a side effect. It's an unintended effect because the therapeutic effect we're looking for is something different, but the medication acts systemically. Untoward effects. Back to my hair falling out. I, I want to get rid of my funky toenails so bad because I want to go to the pool and kick back and get a tan. And ah, if all my hair falls out, I can shave the rest of it off and tan, tan my head. And I can look like some of these cool cops that I see on TV. Some of the cool firemen I see walking around. I see all kinds of cool guys with, with, with smooth shaved heads. I wanted to do that. My wife won't let me. I, and I'm afraid of her. I, all, foot five, all five foot three of her can whip my butt. So we don't want to do that. So untoward effects, that's, that, uh, that would be an example of that. We know that we know we don't want to buy the trade name of a drug when we go to Walgreens or Walmart because it costs a lot more. So we're looking for that generic, right? So the trade name is the manufacturer's brand name assigned to a drug at the time the drug is developed and approved by the Food and Drug Administration, it has a registered trade name. It's protected by federal law for, I can't remember, it doesn't matter that much. I think it's 10 years, don't hold me to that. But there's a protected period when nobody else can produce that drug so that the manufacturer can make lots of bucks off of it during that time. There is a generic name for that drug that's also assigned at the time of development. And it has more to do with the chemical structure of the medication quite often. So they should have used acetaminophen up there for the generic because down here on the bottom of the slide, we have Tylenol. Sometimes you don't, when you look at a medication label, this isn't done this way, but if we're following the way things are supposed to be, trade name is supposed to be capitalized. It's a formal name. So uh, that is, that's the trade name. So uh, my given name is Richard. Uh, very few people call me that. 
but if I was around somebody who couldn't remember my name or they didn't know my name, but they were, we were kind of striking up a, at least a, a decent conversation and they couldn't remember my stinking name. Richard just did not stick, nor did Buddy. And they just started calling me Haas. They just called me Haas. Then uh, that would be lowercase Haas because that's not my my assigned nickname. That was my grandfather's nickname, Haas. But, uh, we all have nicknames in our family. Nobody uses their name. But So trade name is capitalized and and then that generic name is lowercase. So Richard versus, all right, Haas, let's go get this done. That's okay. Medications, we have over-the-counter medications. We have recreational drugs. Hope we're not playing around with those things. Uh, herbal remedies, we have to ask about those. Uh, for instance, if we're going to give our patient a sublingual nitro tablet, we better be asking, if they've taken erectile dysfunction medications like Viagra, Cialis, I can't remember the other names right now, any of those those erectile dysfunction drugs, have you taken any of those within the last 24 hours? That That is extremely important. That is an absolute contraindication in our world if we need to give, if we need to give Nitro, a nitro tablet to our patient with chest pain, we absolutely cannot do it if our patient has taken an erectile dysfunction medication with, within 24 hours. Those are, those are uh, their chemical structure has some common properties. The way that works, it's a vasodilator, and that's how you get the therapeutic effect of an erectile dysfunction medication. If we have already, thinking of their arteries, if we have already made the container larger and then they have already made the container larger by taking their erectile dysfunction medication and they've opened up those, those arterioles and their, and their and their capillaries, and that's what's given them des the desired effect of their medication. And then we add another nitrate, nitroglycerin tablet. We add another nitrate to that. We can we can further dilate the the vasculature and bottom out their blood pressure and kill them. Their chest pain will go away likely, but we kill them. That's why the chest pain went away because they're dead now. It's our fault, and we have something to answer for. So recreation, okay, that was, er, why did I say all of that with herbal remedies? I said all that because that's something you have to know about, about uh, administering nitroglycerin tablets or spray. There are herbal remedies out there. There are supplements because I, some people might be really embarrassed to go talk to their doctor and say, I need a medication to put lead in my pencil. I, I need an erectile dysfunction drug. They're, they're embarrassed to do that. It's a, a private, embarrassing, touchy subject that is so uncomfortable for some people that they ask Uncle Google, got anything out there that I can buy discreetly and I can take so that my pharmacist doesn't know that I'm taking erectile dysfunction meds so my wife might not look at our prescriptions around the house and realize I'm taking this. That could be a really touchy situation if you're taking it because but to pursue the affections of someone who is not your spouse or significant other. There are multiple reasons that somebody says, I'll take an herbal remedy and I found one online and I'm going to take that thing, and nobody but me will know, but it will get the, the desired effect, and this will all be great. We And then they start having that crushing chest pain. We show up, and we better be asking at the same time that we ask, have you taken erectile dysfunction meds? We better also ask them, or 
an herbal supplement that is designed for the same thing, however you want to phrase it. We get to ask kind of uncomfortable questions of all of our patients sometimes. You have to establish that, the real, and you have to document that you ask that. Uh, why do you document it? Because your patient might be so embarrassed, or his wife might be standing there, and he sure doesn't want her to know he's been taking an erectile dysfunction med because they have separate bedrooms and they they don't share a bed for any reason, but he has someone whose bed he shares away from home. So he does not want his wife to know that he's using one of these medications. So he lies to you and he tells you, no, I'm not taking an herbal supplement for that. And I'm not taking a prescription medication for that. And we give him the nitro under the tongue and bam, he bottoms out and he dies. Is that our fault? Heck no, it's not our fault. He lied to us. He, uh, and at that point, he assumed the risk of whatever. But we better document that we asked, or we may be hauled to court in a lawsuit against us, our employer, and our medical director for killing this patient. And if you didn't document that you asked the questions, then you have nothing to rely on to prove that you did. In the end, it might be your word against a dead guy and his widow who's trying to get money. But but if you docu documented it, you, you're going to come out much better. Uh, enhancement drugs. Um, think thing that pops to my head there would be like anabolic steroids. That's different than the steroid shot that you go get at the doctor for your allergies. That is a corticosteroid, entirely different action, enhancement drug, uh, performance enhancing drugs, that kind of thing. We get to ask about all those uh, vitamin supplements, all those things. Let's move on. Let's get to roots of administration. Kind of general umbrellas. Uh, now let's think of it different. We have two big buckets of our different ways we we administer medications to the body. Enteral medications, those are metabolized through the digestive system. Parenteral medications are metabolized by some other means. So let's dump all of our pills, all of the liquids that we take, all of the things that go through our mouth, down our esophagus, into our stomach, into our small intestine, through our colon, and it's absorbed through the digestive system. Those are enteral medications. Our other bucket are parenteral medications. That's everything else. IV uh, suppositories, that's the rectal administration, uh, transdermal uh, lotions or paste that you put on the skin to be absorbed through the skin to bring about uh, s desired systemic or sometimes local effects. Uh, nose sprays, that would be parenteral, eardrops, everything other than the digestive system is parenteral. The dosing for parenteral medications is quite often lower, fewer milligrams, fewer grams, whatever the whatever the the concentration and the and then the the increment of measure for the medications. Quite often, that's that is lower with parenteral medications. Medications that go through the digestive system digestive system, we get what's called first pass metabolism in the liver so that the liver jumps on that medication as it enters the bloodstream and it metabolizes a bunch of that and you lose the, the therapeutic effect because in essence it knocks down your dosage of that medication. So you don't get that with parenteral. 
So uh, for instance, a suppository, what, let's say we have a patient who has frequent seizures and the doctor has prescribed to the family some uh, central nervous system depressant suppositories that are given to be absorbed in that uh, that the mucosa of the rectum uh, you would give a lower dosage than if you gave an oral medication to achieve the same effect because there's no first pass metabolism in the liver from that rectal administration I'll tell you a quick story to point that out uh, something that happened while I was while I was going to Texas Tech I had a professor whose wife died and and he even told the story because it was a class where it fit but uh, his wife was an alcoholic uh, he sent her to rehab over and over and over because he wanted his wife to get past the substance abuse and go back to having the normal relationship that they had. And she would come out of rehab, she'd start drinking again, and over and over and over. His wife died because she decided that she could fool him by giving herself enemas of vodka. And you don't get the liver involved in that first pass metabolism. And she took, apparently she could drink a lot of vodka because she took the same amount that she would drink, a one half fifth of vodka. And she gave herself an enema with roughly 500 milliliters of, of I think it was 110 proof vodka, so roughly 50% alcohol concentration. She gave herself an enema with that, and that parenteral administration of, of that substance shut down her central nervous system. She stopped breathing, then eventually her heart stopped and she died. So that's that's how that works. All right. I guess he wouldn't have told us all of that if he didn't want us to understand it and to pass it on to other people down the road. I hope that doesn't make you think you need to quit drinking and go buy an enema bottle. But All right, absorption. That's the process by which medications travel through body, tish through body tissues and into the bloodstream. Uh, let's use an easy one, even though this is this is not an EMT skill, but for uh, for ease of illustration, let's take an IV medication. Well, not really. Don't do it right now. Take an IV medication that's administered directly into the bloodstream, and then it immediately circulates throughout the body, and you get your desired effect quicker, You're, you achieve your therapeutic, therapeutic effect more quickly, also have your side effects at the same time. So that now let's take a different, uh, a different route of administration. Uh, if we take a medication orally, that has to work through our digestive system. A few medications are absorbed in the in the uh, mucosa of the of the of the stomach, the lining of the stomach, uh, the mu and and then up for the most part, uh, medications, oral medications are absorbed in the small intestine, uh, and then some are absorbed in the large. You get a little bit of kind of end absorption in the in the colon but that medication has to be absorbed into that mucosal lining of the stomach or in the mucosal lining of small intestine 
and then after it is in that mucosa, then it has to be picked up in those capillary beds and move into the bloodstream to be disseminated throughout the body. So that is absorption. That's how it works. The goal is to get the medication into the bloodstream. Unless it's a topical medication, like an itch cream, an anti-itch cream, a corticosteroid cream that you're going to put on a rash on your arm that's itching, that is going to be absorbed and you're going to put that there for the localized effect. Or you put, uh, oh, anyway, we'll keep on moving. I think I've made my point, I hope. If I, if you, if I had anything you have a question about or you think I tell you something wrong, please point it out. I just make this up as I go. No, really, I've read the book several times, my lecture notes and these slides, and started putting these these bolded red, uh, this bolded red font with yellow outline through my slideshows with points I want to make. Uh, I don't know if that's any of, of any help to you, but it kind of helps me. Okay. Uh, roots of administration per rectum. Uh, Back to that suppository or the or that enema that I was talking about. Oral, that's per mouth. Uh, the, these in the, in parentheses are the are the the uh, the abbreviations. Uh, they used to sometimes for oral use per os per mouth. Os is the mouth. IV intravenous straight into the vein, interosseous into the bone. That is an advanced EMT and paramedic skill. Uh, come to advanced EMT class, we'll teach you how to drill a bone and run IV fluid into the bone marrow when you can't get an IV, when it's not practical, get an IV on a patient. It's fast. It doesn't hurt them that bad when it's going in. You have to use a pressure bag to infuse the fluid in because of the density of that bone marrow, and they they say that's when the pain hits. Uh, but these patients are in bad shape and need they need IV fluids and or medications right now. So our go to our backup go to is interosseous. Some medications are administered beneath the skin. That's the subcutaneous route of administration and intramuscular. Uh, many of you, I have caused to need an intramuscular injection because you need to get your shots up to date so you can go to clinical. And I've also caused you to have an inter interdermal injection. When you have that TB skin test and they inject that little bit of serum into your skin to make that little bleb, that little bump, so that they can look for that localized reaction in a couple of days to see whether you have whether you have antibodies to that in your body because you've been exposed to tuberculosis. That's an intradermal injection. Uh, the only time an EMT wouldn't do that, the only time a paramedic would do that would be if they were maybe working in an occupational health clinic or in a minor emergency clinic, something like that. All those are within our scope of practice now. Uh, when some dummy highlighted things, he missed the R here. Uh, continuing with roots of administration. Inhalation, we inhale it into the lungs. So think of the, uh, an inhaler for asthma. Uh, if somebody has asthma and they start to feel their chest tight and maybe they start to wheeze having shortness of breath, they're actually having trouble blowing air out is the problem. They're trapping air and they need to bronch be bronchodilated. So they use that inhaler and that metered dose inhaler is what we call that. And it delivers a beta-2 agonist. Uh, some of them also have a steroid, but it delivers a beta-2 agonist. So what do we get with beta-2? Two lungs attaches the that beta two agonist attaches to the beta two receptors in the smooth muscle lining of or in the smooth muscle I'm sorry in the smooth muscle of the of the bronchioles 
and it's a bronchodilator. It opens those up, and then they can get more air through, in and out. Okay, sublingual, under the tongue, uh, that's the primary way that you will be, give, be giving uh, nitroglycerin tablets for someone having chest pain. They also, also make a spray. I have a picture of that a few slides from now. Transdermal, absorbed through the skin to continue that dose. When the paramedic shows up, you have a chest pain patient, you give them nitro, uh, ALS is responding to your scene, five minutes go by, still chest pain, give them another nitro, and then paramedic crew gets there, they do their ALS stuff, they may slap on nitro paste to get a constant dosage of nitroglycerin being absorbed through your, through the patient's skin to, why are we giving nitro? To try to dilate coronary arteries. That's where the pain is originating, the, the heart muscles being deprived of oxygen because there's a narrowing or a blockage in one of the coronary arteries and we vasodilate that with nitro and then we can get oxygenated blood through to perfuse that the myocardium, that heart muscle may alleviate that pain and buy them some time, hopefully until ER doc and then a cardiologist can work their magic, maybe get them to the cath lab, or maybe they have to go have coronary artery bypass graft surgery because they have a coronary artery that can't be stented. Okay, internasal, nose spray, uh, squirt that up the nose, and it's absorbed through the nasal mucosa. And here is a list. You have a magic chart in your book. Uh, let's talk about it real quickly. I'll bounce through this. Uh, this tells you how quickly these things, these medications are absorbed via these routes of administration. Sublingual, that's fast. Uh, that is quickly absorbed in that mucous membrane. Uh, membrane is the word I was looking for a few minutes ago when we were down there in the in the intestines and, I, and in, the, in the stomach, that lining of the stomach. I couldn't remember the dang word membrane. Now we have it. All right. Uh, sublingual, uh, that's absorbed quickly in that mucous membrane under the tongue. Yeah, that medication quickly moves into those capillary beds under the tongue and moves out. Uh, and, and by capillary beds, I'm also including the... Uh, Anyway, so absorbed in those capillary beds and then circulated out to the body. Uh, that's how sublingual works. That's also how per rectum works, how, how a suppository or an enema would work. That's rapid absorption. And there is, this is kind of confusing because we're taking a sublingual tablet in our mouths. And we think of that as maybe being part of digestion. In fact, last week in the human body, I told you it was. So why is it enteral to put it under the tongue? Our digestive system isn't involved. It's direct absorption. It's fast. It's right now absorption. You don't get that first pass metabolism in the, in the, in, by the liver so that it knocks down the amount of available medication in the body. So that's why sublingual is here with enteral. And then PO by mouth, that's slow because it, it involves our full digestive system. And I said, I said sublingual isn't enteral. And I said per rectum isn't. I, I still think those two belong down with parenteral. You're not going to get that question from me on the exam. You're not going to get that question from the National Registry. They might want to know how quickly things are absorbed by, by different routes of administration. That's okay. Don't let my personal, my education and opinion skew what your book says, but I think those are parenteral. Anyway, IV, that's right now. Boom, right into the, into the bloodstream. We don't have to wait for it to be absorbed through a mucous membrane anywhere. It's just bam right now. Interosseous is the same way. Sounds crazy, doesn't it? We're going to push a medication 
into the bone marrow. And it seems like it'd take a while for that to get into circulation, but no, it is, it's, it's right now, just like IV. Inhalation, that is rapid. That's, that's absorbed uh, in the respiratory system. Intranasal, that is absorbed in your nasal mucosa in the same way that that sublingual tablet is absorbed and moved into the bloodstream uh, through that, that nasal mucosa. I am, it's not like in the movies, an I am injection most of the time is going to take 15 to 30 minutes to, to start to take effect. So it's not, bam, you give them the sedative and they fall over in their tracks. That's just not how it works. Uh, different medications are absorbed more quickly than others I am, but it's a medium route of administration. Sub-Q is slow. Uh, transcutaneous, it says slow, but that's it can be pretty quick. I think there's also a chart in your book that, that has the, the order of the rapidity of absorption. That's all right. Let's see how long we've been going. Let's do a few more slides and let's do medication forms and we'll take a five minute break. Get some, some that blood that's pooled in your tail end back in your brain. I know I need it. I can't think of mucosa. Good Lord. Okay. The form of medication, uh, it dictates the route of administration. And that's determined through research. That's determined by the manufacturer. That's uh, determined by research presented to the FDA when the medication is approved. That's not something you have to worry much about. Uh, we get it how we get it, and we use it the way they tell us, right? Uh, but the manufacturer, through research, uh, chooses the proper route of administration, Timing of the medications released into the bloodstream. Uh, let's think about a time-released oral medication. How does that work? The, 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 these little, the little balls inside that capsule, do they have little clocks in, it, in them that tell them when to pop open? No, they have different coatings that, that break down some of them really quickly to get a dose right now. Some of them, those coatings, might not break down until that medication has had time to move all the way through the small intestine and then it's absorbed there and maybe that's two hours later. Maybe it's, that's, that's how it works. That's how a time release medication works. So uh, we don't determine that, the manufacturer determines that. We set, can't set the little clock on them yet and tell them when to pop open. And then uh, research, uh, they be in developing a medication, they begin with the effect they want that medication to have on organs or body systems. I need a toenail funk pill that's going to kill that fungus in these toenails so people can wear flip-flops and go to the pool and not be embarrassed. That would be the target body system, those, the, those toenails. And do research to develop an oral medication that will, whose therapeutic effect is to fix funky fungus toenails. All right, so that's the target or a target organ, uh, that inhaler, uh, maybe the maybe the inhaler that somebody uses every day, or like the Advair that I take for my asthma every day. The the desired therapeutic effect of that is to deliver a steroid into my bronchioles to decrease inflammation, so that I don't have an exacerbation of my asthma or an asthma attack. So target organ there would be the bronchioles and does have systemic effects, but that's the, that's the target organ and, or medication, a, a beta blocker. The target organ is the heart. Uh, unfortunately, that beta blocker blocks, has a blocking effect on 
beta one. And if you have a patient who is, they're losing blood and normally they would, and they're going into hypovolemic shock and normally they would, their fight or flight system would kick in and they would have, uh, they're increasing their heart rate and contract, contractility of their heart to help compensate for the shock that their, that their body is moving into. But there's a beta blocker there that prevents that fight or flight system from doing its thing and those patients die much more quickly. All right, moving on the rest of the way through forms, basic forms. You're familiar with all of these. We're going to talk about them real quick anyway. Tablets and capsules. Tablet is a solid little pill kind of thing. A capsule is like a, a gelatin capsule. I used to think they were plastic when I was a kid. I didn't want to swallow plastic. Because when I did it otherwise, my mom got upset. Because it was supposedly would give me appendicitis eventually. Kind of like I biting your fingernails and swallowing those were supposed to give you appendicitis. I don't know how. That's just old wives tale. Some idiot got caught swallowing fingernails one time, then he had appendicitis. So, oh man, that's all right. Let's don't go there. All right. Back to capsules. Have a gelatin coating that dissolves in the stomach and then that releases a bunch of smaller small little balls, I guess we'll say, because I can't think of the right term, but but small little dosages of that medication to be absorbed, possibly in different places and at different rates throughout the body, uh, or throughout the digestive tract, I'm sorry. Uh, solutions is suspensions. Solutions, uh, think of a vial of medication that's sitting on the shelf in the doctor's office and you know dad gum good and well you're a kid you know you're going to get a shot because you see that bottle of medication it is a solution it doesn't separate it out when it sits there you're lucky enough you don't get a shot and mom hauls you to the pharmacy to get something for your earache and and an antibiotic has been prescribed an oral antibiotic and it's a suspension. There's a powder there, they put a liquid in it and shake it up and it appears to be all one thing and then you take your dose of that and hopefully the therapeutic effect happens. Uh, now comes time for the next dose. It's been sitting in the refrigerator. The powdery part of that has, it has separated out. That is a suspension. It kind of falls apart into its liquid and solid layers again, and it has to be, it says shake well before administering, right? That's a suspension. Meter dose inhaler, that asthma inhaler, poof, you push it, and every time you get the same amount of the medication delivered, every time you squeeze that device down. Topical medications will absorb through the skin uh, for to for a localized effect benadryl cream to stop an itch to to stop a localized allergic reaction block the histam those uh, act as a histamine blocker to help stop the itch transcutaneous medications that's different we're back to the nitro paste to provide an ongoing continuous dose of a medication there are, uh, we're all familiar with fentanyl because we hear about it on the news all the time that all the fentanyl overdoses, all the people in the street using fentanyl for therapeutic reasons, for people with, with chronic pain, intractable pain, they're sometimes given fentanyl patches. The dosage of fentanyl is placed on a little plastic square that has adhesive edges, peel it apart, stick it on, and it's slowly absorbed through the skin to deliver a small continuous dosage of fentanyl to help deal with pain. Uh, the thing is, it feels pretty good with one, but I'm still hurting. So man, I'll put two on there and then I got five and I have 10. 
Then I'm overdosed in the bathroom at the law firm. And my law partner comes in to pee and finds me unconscious on the floor because I've got 14 fentanyl patches on me. That didn't happen to me or anybody else. It was an episode of some show I saw on TV. All right, gases for inhalation. One we're most familiar with and the one that you are going to administer to patients is what? Oxygen. All right, let's take a five minute break and then we'll come back and take some tablets and capsules. I mean, we will talk about tablets and capsules. Tablets and capsules. Tablet, caplet, or capsules are gelatin shells filled with powdered or liquid medication. I just covered all that before I got to these slides. Tablets contain other materials that are mixed with the medication and compressed into a hard or a semi-hard tablet form. Uh, again, the manufacturer determines what the form is. Uh, gel caps, you have those now. That's a capsule with the medication. Uh, people with achy backs and hips like me, we think that that Aleve gel caps are absorbed and work better and faster than taking the old hard tablet form. Probably the placebo effect. Probably that's all in my head. I feel like it works faster. I don't know. I haven't seen studies. I don't care enough to go look. Solutions and suspensions. Just talked about them. Solutions don't separate out. They are in a pharmaceutical lab. They're manufactured. They stay the and different medications are put into solution uh, with different solutes or the liquid part uh, or different solutions uh, and that boy it's been a long time since chemistry hadn't it buddy uh, the different chemicals or different uh, now, different different liquid chemicals are used. Uh, some even contain uh, maybe even some like a little bit of hydrochloric acid. Some uh, contain sulfates. It depends on what is going to to maintain the the medication itself and not let it separate out and not diminish the effectiveness of the the molecules of the medication and provide the best delivery to the body in a solution form that the body can tolerate. Uh, those medications with a little hydrochloric acid in them, those suckers burn a little bit when you get the shot. That's how you know the good stuff's coming, right? All right. Uh, IV, IM, sub-Q injections, uh, that would be solutions and then, uh, all right, uh, suspension I've already talked about. It separates out when you filter it or when you sit it on the shelf. It usually says somewhere prominently shake well before administering or shake well before using. Meter dose inhaler. That's the old asthma inhaler we're all familiar with. Either liquids or solids broken down into small droplets or particles so that you can inhale them. Each each press of the cartridge down into the plastic delivery portion of the inhaler delivers the same dosage of medication every time. That's why it's metered dose inhaler. And we're delivering that down to the lungs. Uh, Often we're looking for the effect, uh, maybe even some some of it absorbed in the bronchioles themselves. All right, you don't have to worry about that. All you have to know is find the right medication and use it at the right time. It's the right dose, it's the right thing, and it's in the right date. And our patient isn't allergic to it and we can give it. Okay, topical medications, creams, lotions, ointments. There are some examples. Calamine lotion is a lotion. When do we use that? Uh, we get poison ivy. We use that to help stop the itching, deal with the inflammation. 
uh, we're a little more, maybe we're a little more modern than that. We want to use hydrocortisone cream and Benadryl on the, on the poison ivy. Calamine lotion probably works better. Uh, and then, and then uh, a topical antibiotic. You have a little scrape on your arm and the edges start to get red and it feels kind of warm. Uh, that thing's getting infected. Uh, probably have a little staph infection firing up there and you put some topical neosporin ointment on there to help knock down that infection. Okay, transcutaneous absorbed through the skin. It's also called transdermal. So uh, transcutaneous or transdermal nitroglycerin fentanyl, like I've already talked about, it's absorbed and it has systemic effects, but it's administered through the skin. A word of caution, if you are applying a transdermal medication, a transcutaneous medication to someone other than yourself, wear gloves. You will absorb it through your fingers. I can't tell you how I know this, but back in the old days for nitro paste, we had a little piece of paper that was marked out in quarter inches, one inch, one and a quarter on up to two inches. And that's how much nitro paste you put on there. And then you applied it to your patient. Have I mentioned that we only wore gloves for sterile procedures back then? I, can, I have heard that if you are putting trans, a transdermal nitro on someone, and you get some on your fingers while you're applying that nitro to that paper, it will make me really dizzy and feel kind of flushed all over and kind of see black for just a moment and then the effects start to reverse and then I, he could go on and take care of the patient. So wear gloves, don't absorb that through your own skin. You don't want to test positive for opiates when you haven't been prescribed any and you you're not going to be doing this as an EMT, but let's say for argument's sake, you're, maybe your great uncle Fred, who's going to leave you $12 million when he dies, needs some, some help with his home hospice care. And you swing by and help good old uncle Fred four times a day by giving him a bed bath and putting him on the bedpan taking him off the bedpan, cleaning him up. You take such good care of old Uncle Fred, and he has horrible pain, and, and fentanyl patches are prescribed for good old Uncle Fred, and you don't wear gloves when you're putting those on. You're working your EMT job. Uh, let's say it, uh, Lubbock County EMS, and I think they don't even have that anymore. It has a different name now, but Lubbock County EMS, and and you take good care of Uncle Fred, but you absorb some of his fentanyl through your skin because you didn't need, you didn't wear gloves with Uncle Fred because it made him uncomfortable because he had some glove phobia and it was an intense one and you didn't want him to write you out of the will and not give you your $12 million when he was gone, but you absorb some of that through your skin and, and you pop positive on a piss test, excuse me, on your on a on a random drug screen, your uh, your analysis drug screen at your job, you get fired. You lose your EMT certification, and it turns out Uncle Fred had left his twelve million dollars to his dog with a stipend for of a thousand dollars a year for whoever would take care of his dog. So now you don't have a job as an EMT. You don't have your certification, and you're on the street without a job. Uncle Fred's dead. You're stuck taking care of the dog for a little less than $100 a month. So wear gloves. That's what some of these patches look like. It uh, has an adhesive patch, put it on the skin, the medication is absorbed. Uh, Semi-liquid, the one you will be using in the, with the proper patient would be uh, glucose paste. You give that to hypoglycemic Patients will study those in detail in a couple of weeks. I keep saying a couple of weeks because I don't memorize which chapters come next. I just look them up in 
kind of prepare them for this lecture, right? You're saying, dude, you didn't prepare very well. All right, so uh, these are uh, gels, uh, oral glucose is, uh, that's a good, uh, good example. Let's talk about gases. Again, I said oxygen would be the one that you administer, and we already know how to administer oxygen. Uh, how much to administer, why to administer it, uh, whether we need a nasal cannula at two liters or we need a non-rebreather mask, or we got to go to the big guns and have a bag valve mask with reservoir that is connected to an O2 supply to deliver close to 100% oxygen to our patients with each, with each ventilation we provide. We don't practice medicine, like I said at the beginning of this. We only administer medications under the authorization of medical control. That can be offline medical control, our standing orders, our protocols. Doctor signs off on those and, and we operate under that doctor's license and that doctor is allowing us by standing order to administer those medications or online medical control, remember that from the very beginning of this course, you have to either call on the phone or get on the radio and request permission to give a drug. Six rights of medication administration we'll get to in a few minutes. And medication errors, if we follow the six rights, that greatly decreases, if not almost eliminates our chance of making a medication error. I'm not talking about the guy who lies to you about the Viagra and you give him nitro and then he dies. I'm talking about when you don't ask him about the Viagra and you give him a nitro and he dies. So let's look at the six rights that I believe you might memorize prior to the next exam and hang on to those throughout the rest of the course through the National Registry and into the streets when you go to work. Right patient, right medication, right dose, right route, right time, right documentation. It used to be the five R's and we added the right documentation a few years ago. Why? The example I used earlier, uh, if you don't document it, it didn't happen. And if you're called to court to testify or if they subpoena your records to be reviewed, it looks like you didn't do it, then you wind up triggering a lawsuit, a negligence suit against you for medical negligence. And they also sue your medical control director. And then under principles of, of, of uh, agency, they also sue your employer. Everybody's on the hook. Everybody gets sued. Everybody has to go to court because you didn't document that you gave a medication or that you ask the proper questions prior to administering the medication. So learn these six, these six rights. It's easy. Right patient, right medication, right patient. That's the one in front of us, right? Uh, but that include, that could include adult. Is it adult patient, pediatric patient? Doesn't have to be the patient's name. In the hospital, they ask you, what your name is and while they're looking at your dang and what your birth date is while they're looking at your little wristband with your with your name on it they don't just go by the room number they don't just wander around slamming meds into people hopefully so right patient is really important in the emergency department it's really important in the hospital uh, in a little bit different way than it is in our world but right patient is, that includes the person who needs this medication that I'm going to give right now. And is it, is it an adult? Is it a child? Is it an infant? Is it a geriatric patient? So right patient, right medication to achieve the therapeutic effect that will benefit our patient, right dose. Are we given the, what is the right amount of this medication to give? We don't just give them some and see what happens, uh, hopefully right root? Are we given this medication uh, per rectum with a suppository? Or are we giving it sublingually? 
I would submit to you that the two are quite different. So the right route of administration for the medication that you're giving, the right time, different in the hospital than in our world, maybe. Seems like the right time's right freaking now because I need to give it, right? But then, and so I need to give my chest pain patient a sublingual nitro tablet right now. What if it doesn't work right? Can I give it again? I can give it again. If his blood pressure is high enough, her blood pressure is high enough, oh, well, what's the right time to give my repeat dose of sublingual nitro? Five minutes. Okay. So what is important? Write down the time that you administer a dosage of a medication to your patient. And then you know when the next dose can be administered. And when you document it, you can document the time that you gave dose one, time you gave dose two, including how your patient responds to all that, but we're on the, on the R's right now. So then the right documentation. It's, it's obvious stuff, it's, uh, but it is important enough that we need to go through it. On, an, on a BLS ambulance or a BLS fire truck or in a BLS uh, little clinic kind of infirmary thing, say you're working at a Girl Scout camp and it's a, it, and you have, and you even have written protocols where a doctor has set forth what you can do to take care of people who have emergencies in that camp. You could expect to have oxygen, oral glucose, activated charcoal, we'll talk about in a minute, that you use for certain overdoses. And then aspirin, not for, not for, I, I hurt a little bit, so I'll take an aspirin. I have a headache, I'll take an aspirin. Uh, we're gonna use it for a different purpose with our patients that we, who we suspect might be having a, an MI, they're having a heart attack. And then epinephrine. And uh, forever, I would have told you this would be an epinephrine auto injector. These things are so expensive now. For a while, they were up at 600 bucks. And now they're down possibly around 100. Still, uh, for the price of a small syringe, and needle and a small vial of epinephrine and teaching you to draw that up in a syringe for, for pennies for less than a dollar, probably less than five bucks anyway, can administer the same thing. So that might be the form that you have your epinephrine. So you could get to draw it up and shoot it if that's, if that's how it's provided and you have an order that allows you to do that, that's within your scope of practice. Uh, moving on with, with administration. It's not always, in our world as EMTs, it's not always us administering the, me the medication. Sometimes we assist a patient in the administration of their medication. So the epinephrine auto injector. Maybe our medical control director does not want us as EMTs stabbing a hole in someone. He would rather have us, I don't even understand why this would be, but operating off the doctor's license, it's the doctor's call. They lay their license on the line when they sign those protocols and let us do stuff. Or when they get on the phone with us or the radio and they approve our, our request for orders to give a medication. So it's their license on the line. So I understand it. I, man, four years of college, four years of medical school, five years of residency, and then I sign off on protocols. And I don't quite feel comfortable with having 763 firefighter EMTs who are out there injecting people with medications. I just don't quite feel comfortable with that. But I do feel comfortable with them helping a patient get their epi auto injector out of the protective tube that it comes in, 
maybe even swabbing the skin with alcohol on the on the thigh the quadricep where this is administered and then i feel comfortable with the emt arming the device and placing it in the hand of the patient and saying now stab yourself in the leg here that's that's the doctor's call and none of us should have a problem with that if you can just imagine after high school spending 17 years of your life and having your entire livelihood riding on allowing us to go out and stab needles in people and shoot medications into them you can picture why in some places there are more restrictions on what we're allowed to do than others we still get irritated by it but we shouldn't peer assisted what in the heck is that uh, we lay the medication down on the pier by the by the lake and we lay down and roll around in it no wrong kind of pier that was a horrible joke but i didn't hear you laugh and greta didn't even wake up so it uh, wasn't that funny i didn't even laugh it's it sounded good in my brain all right peer assisted that's when we administer medications to one another as emts and emergency responders well that's stupid we don't do that you're not supposed to give each other drugs right it could be that we're emt firefighters eventually and we're on a hazmat crew and we have been exposed to a toxic substance and we have a standing order that if we are exposed to an organ an organophosphate that we have an organ we suffer organophosphate poisoning ourselves or our partner does then we're going to and both of us do we're going to inject each other with these spring-loaded medications that we will learn about when we do the toxicologic emergencies chapter on down the road all right that's giving them to each other national registry every now and then throws throws those in there uh, what medications we give when we give them how we give them whether they're peer assisted patient assisted assisted or emt administered uh, which ones of these medications or other medications that we're allowed to give is to determine in some states let's say california for instance great big state but california has statewide approved protocols for emts advanced emts and paramedics so anywhere you go in california they have the same standardized protocols i believe new york does the same thing i think maybe even new mexico does the same thing in texas it is more regionalized and or localized based on what the medical control director who signs the protocols wants to be done all right so uh, medical control that can be your medical control director signing your protocols that would be offline medical control that can be getting on the radio or on the telephone with the doctor and getting online medical control they are on the line right there talking to you you paint a verbal picture of what you found in your patient assessment what what your patient's chief complaint is and why you need to provide this this pharmaceutical intervention to your patient right stinking now or your patient's going to die and doctor this is what i want to give and how much i want to give of it all right you know what you're doing you told me exactly what's going on with your patient i trust you because you've always told me exactly what's going on with your patient and you never deviate from what i approve for you to do so i trust you to do it again now that is your reputate building your reputation with those er docs with medical control so that they trust you and they will approve what you need to take care of your patient how many shots do you get at maintaining your reputation or at at screwing up your reputation for want of a better term we're in texas we can talk like that right we're all 
we're all adults, so we can do that. Uh, if you screw up your reputation, let's say, oh, he always lets me give Epi with that Epi auto injector, so I'm just going to go ahead and do it, and then I'll request the order. Oh, the order's denied. Oh, man, we have to fess up. We gave the Epi. Your reputation is blown. You don't get a second shot, so don't mess it up. I have known good paramedics, especially paramedics. I've known good paramedics who did just what I described. It wasn't an EpiPen. It was something else. But they hit the point in the protocol that they needed a doctor's order to proceed further and hot shot paramedic. They went ahead and did it. Then the order was denied. They had to fess up at the ER and tell that doctor what they did and the excrement impacted the rotary oscillator. I can tell you a few of those times I was the operations supervisor who was called at 3.30 in the morning while I was dead asleep. Do you know what your effing paramedic did? No, sir, I don't, but I'm about to find out. And oh man, don't do that. You won't do that. You're better than that. And that rarely happens. But I'm going to use extreme examples, some based on my experience, because I want you to learn from where other people may be screwed up. Even where I screwed up, I'll tell you some things that I've screwed up before. Fortunately, I didn't kill anybody with it. Okay. The medications that you're allowed to use may be determined by the state within which you practice as an EMT, could be determined by your department. Uh, your medical director in the end will determine what medications are carried on your ambulance. There are things that to be a licensed ambulance allowed to transport patients, you have to have oxygen, right? And you have to have nasal cannulas and you have to have oral pharyngeal airways and you have to have in the state of Texas have to have epinephrine you have to have meter dose inhalers you have to have oral glucose you have to have all of these things at a bare minimum in the state then your department could add to that based on the desires of your medical director and that is how that works. Lots of steps, and there should be. All right, oral medications, they're right there. They're easy. You don't have to mix them up. You pop a, pop a tablet in your hand, and you take it, right? We have aspirin tablets in our hand. We have a patient having chest pain. We think they're having an MI, and we pop three baby aspirin in their mouth and four baby aspirin, and we tell them, to chew those four baby aspirins and swallow those. Uh, so that it's ease of access, ease of use, that chewing that aspirin. The baby aspirin probably don't taste too bad, but if it's one adult aspirin, a 325 milligram adult aspirin, oh man, taste would be horrible. They're not gonna like us anymore after that. Disadvantages, takes time to be absorbed in the digestive tract the amount of food that our patient may or may not have eaten can interfere with, uh, can, make, can cause that medication if they haven't eaten and they're supposed to. The, it can cause medication to be absorbed too quickly. If they've eaten too much, it's absorbed more slowly. If they have, uh, let's say, uh, you always see commercials for medications for irritable bowel disease. Let's say our patient does have irritable bowel disease and it seems like everything they eat goes from their stomach to the toilet in 15 minutes, it's gonna be difficult for them to absorb oral medications in their digestive tract. So that's what we mean by illness. Uh, several other illnesses that could, could affect that also. And then, all right, that's uh, covered that. Oral medications, uh, Contraindication to the administration of anything by mouth, including these oral medications, would be a patient who cannot protect their own airway and can't follow instructions to swallow. Who might that be? 
That might be a patient who is hypoxic or dehydrated and they're not perfusing their brain properly. Their level of consciousness is decreased. We cannot give them anything by mouth. Fortunately, we don't give a lot of medications by mouth. All right. Another oral medication. Oh, this is nasty stuff. And we used to carry it. We had, we had a powder of this activated charcoal in the ambulance and we had these little squirt bottle things and we put normal saline, sterile normal saline solution in there. And then we put this powdered charcoal in there and then we shook it up and then we either put it down an NG tube for an overdose or we had our patients swallow it. We wore white shirts back then. You'd get that crap all over you, all over the back of the ambulance. It's horribly messy. They happen to have some activated charcoal capsules now that have that powdered activated charcoal that is inside those capsules. So it's not as messy. When do we use this stuff? Certain overdoses of medications and other substances, we can give oral activated charcoal and what it does medications and other substances, certain substances bind to those charcoal molecules. And that charcoal also has, oh good Lord, I just lost the word. Uh, mm, a laxative effect, yeah, I'm sorry. It also has a laxative effect. So it helped, it, the, it, Say it's, a, say it's a drug overdose and they just swallowed the pills. They haven't had time to metabolize them. We give them activated charcoal. The medication binds to the charcoal molecules and then the laxative effect moves that quickly on through the digestive tract so it can't be absorbed. That is how that works. Sorry, I lost the word laxative. I try to avoid those at all costs apparently. Okay, uh, administered by mouth. If your patient has altered level of consciousness, they took 60 hydrocodone, 10 milligram hydrocodone tablets, and let's say patient A took them 10 minutes ago. Mom came in, found kid sitting on, teenager sitting on the bed, found this suicide note over there, says, holy crap, and there's an empty pill bottle, call us, we show up, we get an order, we, the patient's conscious alert, well-oriented, protecting their airway, bam, we can give them the activated charcoal, and we can block that absorption and the, the laxative effect, carry that on through the patient's digestive tract. Now, the, the boyfriend of, of teenager one, uh, it may, this is Romeo and Juliet kind of story. Parents don't want these two kids to be together. They refuse it. It's absolutely not going to happen. And they were going to run away together, but then they got caught. And they had a suicide pact. And they both had a bottle with 60 count of hydrocodone, hydrocodone 10 milligram. 10, 10 milligrams of hydrocodone with 325 milligrams of acetaminophen. They both took 60. They, and they both wrote their suicide notes about if we can't be together here, we'll be together in eternity. And the whole Romeo and Juliet thing, mom found the daughter 15 minutes after she took her. She was conscious, alert, and well-oriented. Boyfriends, parents, don't get home from work until four hours later. He's unconscious, unresponsive. Uh, now let's make it make it less than that. An hour later, we don't want him to be dead yet. An hour later, they get home. He's unconscious. He's unresponsive. He has snoring respirations. He's breathing four times a minute, uh, and. We cannot give him activated charcoal, number one, because, because of his level of consciousness, number two, because he's already absorbed a large percentage of that synthetic opiate in those tablets. What does he need? 
he needs a back valve mask right now so that we so that we take over and ventilate him and then we'll want to give him some narcan to try to block the that opiate and block the effects of that opiate and hopefully improve the condition of our poor patient okay oral glucose is administered to hypoglycemic patients patients whose sugar level is too low and it's administered and they still need to be conscious and able to protect their airway. If not, we can't do this. We need an ALS ambulance. We need a paramedic with IV glucose to administer to deal with this hypoglycemia. If the patient's level of consciousness is adequate, we maybe they just feel shaky and a little bit dizzy, but they can they can hear us, they can follow instructions. We administer this oral glucose with an order, of course, via the buccal route of administration. What in the world is buccal? Uh, where, do, where do all these guys running around, and a few girls, where do you put a dip of Copenhagen or skull? Skull, not skull. That's a different thing. Where do you put a dip of Copenhagen or skull? You stick it between your cheek and your gum. So you have that big thing sticking out like that, and you talk like this when you're doing your lecture, right? Okay, that is the buccal route, and that's absorbed into that that mucous membrane uh, there uh, on the gum and on the inside of the cheek. That is the buccal route of administration. Uh, patient has to be conscious and able to protect their airway. Aspirin, why do we give aspirin? I said we don't give it for a headache. We use it with our patients who are having a heart attack. You're gonna learn how this works and what, what causes a myocardial infarction. Oh, around chapter 16, I think. Don't hold me to that, but it's somewhere in there. One thing, so what happens in a heart attack? You have this plaque that builds up in arterial wall and it gets bigger and bigger over time and eventually that ruptures and it causes a little bleed there what happens when you cut yourself your body tries to stop the bleed it it mobilizes platelets and sends those platelets to the side of that injury to try to stop bleeding so in a heart attack, we need to keep those platelets from building up, uh, we'll call it a scab because we had not gotten there yet, from trying to build up a scab. That's not what it is at all, but you can all picture that. We want to prevent that aggregation of platelets in the clotting cascade. We want to prevent those from clumping together and further blocking off that coronary artery. So we have our patient chew and swallow aspirin, chew it so it's absorbed faster, and it inhibits or inhibits or cuts down on the ability of those platelets to clump together at the side of that injury and hopefully stops that infarction where it is. Then we give nitro to vasodilate that coronary artery. Now we've opened up the space that was being occluded by that, that injury within that, that coronary artery. And now our patient feels better. They're perfusing their heart muscle better. This is if things go according to plan. Uh, the, the therapeutic effect of all of this, they're, they're perfusing, they're getting oxygen and and glucose to the heart muscle and carrying away carbon dioxide so their heart muscle doesn't hurt anymore. They don't have that squeezing chest pain, hopefully, and we can buy them some time until they can get to the, cardi the cardiac cath lab and either put, open that up and put a stent in there. Think of a slinky stuck inside of a coronary artery that holds that open so that blood can flow through there. If that can't be done, they haul the patient to surgery, crack their chest open. I'll show you a video of how this is done here in another couple of weeks. And they just actually plumb around. They take, they 
do a graft and they plumb around that blockage, hence the term bypass, so that blood can flow around and pass that blockage. So little preview of coming attractions, all right. Uh, who can we not give aspirin to? If we have a patient who is allergic to aspirin, I'm not talking it makes me nauseated and it makes my blood thin and I bleed a lot if I get cut. Those are side effects. Uh, a true allergy, we're talking I break out in hives, feel like my throat's closing up, and I've almost died from taking it before because I went into anaphylactic shock. Oh, we're not going to give it then, right? If we have a patient with, and asthma is going to be a relative contraindication in this heart attack situation because it's a, it's a balancing act. It's a cost-benefit analysis or a risk-benefit analysis. The risk to our patient from not giving it when they're having a heart attack, heart attack, the risk is far greater than the risk of triggering an asthma attack. So we can go ahead and give it then if we have a doctor's order that says so. How do we protect ourselves so that we don't wind up in trouble from doing that? We get on the radio or on the cell phone, we contact the ER doc and we say, hey doc, have this guy having chest pain, blah, 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 blah. He says that he has asthma. I would like permission to go ahead and have him chew and swallow 324 milligrams of aspirin. The doc is gonna say, expletive yes, go ahead and do it because we can treat an asthma attack. He's gonna die right now. Our, our heart muscle is dying right in front of us. You don't regenerate cardiac cells. Those suckers are dying. We can't, we have to stop the death here. So, okay, go ahead. All right, bleeding disorders. Why? Because of the inhibi inhibition of platelet aggregation, right? We learned some new stuff today. All right. Uh, that would be if we're taking it for fever, pain, or inflammation. Again, get on the horn, talk to the ER doc about whether or not you're going to give it if your patient has a bleeding disorder. Good Lord, we're not hematolo hematologists. So let's get somebody who has a whole lot of education and writes MD or DO after their name to help us out with this situation. All right. Kids cannot be given aspirin. Uh, a kid with, uh, with a, a viral illness uh, who is given aspirin that can tr trigger uh, a condition called RISE syndrome that can kill that kiddo. So uh, even though we say we have baby aspirin, chew and swallow 481 milligram baby aspirins that's just what they've been called forever because that's the concentration, but they're not for kids. Do not give aspirin to your kids. Don't let anyone around you give aspirin to their kids. Don't give aspirin to anybody else's kids. All right, point made. Moving on, sublingual meds are easy, uh, easy to advise a patient how to use it. Quick absorption, disadvantage. We still have to stay on top of that airway. They could choke. Uh, I think you could probably aspirate one of those little devils and probably wouldn't kill your patient to be uncomfortable, but let's don't do that. Let's don't have them aspirate that sublingual nitro tablet that we give them. Uh, patients can be uncooperative. They won't, they won't hold their tongue up. They won't open their mouths. They won't, they're just uncooperative. I can't do that. It burns when you put that under my tongue. That means it's good stuff. That's one of the things I'm gonna tell you about nitro. All right, we've got to keep moving. I'm getting behind here. Talked about the buccal root already. That's where it goes. Uh, that's a, actually a tablet being administered buccally. Okay, there's nitro spray. Nitro, the tablets that we give, the, uh, the concentration is 0 0.4 milligrams of, of nitroglycerin sublingually. This spray, every time you push the spray into your patient's mouth, that delivers guess what? 0 0.4 milligrams of nitro. This is that nitro paste that I was talking about. This little paper over here is marked off. That's how I got the stuff on my hands and almost passed out. That's how the spray works. It's not breast spray. 
before we administer nitro, we need to check our patient's blood pressure. Have to have systolic blood pressure greater than 100 in order to administer nitro. So you have to have that baseline set of vitals. And then for each readministration, each follow-up dose, you have to check the blood pressure. That systolic blood pressure has to be above 100. That is an absolute contraindication in our world. Come to paramedic school, we will add some new sticks to your bag of tricks that you can use to still administer nitro to a patient whose systolic blood pressure used to be less than 100. We'll get it a little higher and we'll move on. Or we'll administer it and then we'll jack the blood pressure back up if we need to. Uh, okay. I uh, already talked about erectile dysfunction drugs. It may call, and these are things you need to tell your patient before ad administering this. This may give you a mild headache. It might make you feel a little dizzy. That is not going to last very long. What that means is that the medication is still working. It's administered under the tongue sublingually. Tell your patient you're going to feel a tingling or a burning. Uh, and storage is important. Uh, we'll talk a lot more about that later. But nitro, those nitro tablets have to be kept at room temperature, roughly, and they have to be kept out of light. UV light causes that to break down. Uh, carrying those things around in the pocket, they rub together. It decreases the amount of medication on each tablet and the heat from being up against someone's leg that can totally inactivate the effectiveness of the nitro. If they've already taken their nitro and it didn't burn under their tongue and didn't make them dizzy, their nitro is no good. Use yours. Have to wait five minutes before the re repeat dose. Again, make sure that systolic blood pressure is above 100 and then can repeat one more time five minutes after that in under most protocols. Uh, wear gloves, monitor those vital signs, like I said. I am injections. They're quick. They're easy. You don't have to find a vein. Uh, it's given in a muscle that has stable blood flow. That is not an EMT skill. Uh, it's an invasive procedure. You're sticking the needle in a patient. Uh, there's pain. There's risk of infection. Uh, patients are scared of it. Some, I don't mind getting a shot. I'd rather have a shot, get my and get well faster. Not everybody's like that. All right. Uh, epinephrine, I've talked about it already. It's a sympathomimetic. I forgot that word. It mimics the action of the sympathetic nervous system by, with its beta 1, beta 2, and alpha properties. Alpha, alpha properties cause vasoconstriction. learn a lot more about this later. We're almost done. That's using the epi auto injector. Yes, it can be administered IJ intra gene. Those are blue genes maybe, or those are gray genes. No, that's not real. But in a pinch, you can give it through the pants. I would cut a hole there. If it's a serious enough situation that I need to give the epi, I need a bare leg that I can swab and pop that sucker in there. Uh, Narcan, I mentioned it earlier, it's used in opiate overdoses. Uh, we need an order from medical control. Uh, most services uh, on, and on most fire trucks, you're going to carry Narcan. It is not, uh, it's not an antidote for opiates like most people think. It is a blocker. It binds to the opiate receptor sites in the brain, that's not the true name of them, but we're going to call them opioid receptor sites. It binds to those sites and it prevents the, the further uh, it prevents the patient from further metabolizing and absorbing into the central nervous system. That opiate, uh, okay, 
uh, there's a picture kind of it. That's the names of those receptors. I'm just going to call them opiates for now. I found this picture online because I liked it because I thought it dem had a good did a good job of demonstrating a receptor and all our little our little molecules of our drug that want to bind to that receptor, but we put Narcan in there and we block that. How much Narcan do we give and when do we give it? Uh, we'll do that in toxicologic emergencies, but we give Narcan for, uh, for opiate overdoses. We give, it's 0 0.4 milligrams administered intranasally. We have a syringe and a little nasal atomizer that I'll show you in lab, and you put, you put point, 0 0.2 milligrams of Narcan in each nostril. It's absorbed in the nasal, nasal mucosa, and then it trucks around in the body blocking these opiate receptors. Oxygen, you have studied. Uh, meter dose inhalers, I've told you that we use those for, uh, for bronchodilators uh, due to their beta-2 agonist effects. The nebulizer, we connect to our oxygen supply. We put the medication in this little reservoir. We run oxygen through it, makes a mist. Our patient breathe that, breathes that, and that delivers medication down to the alveoli, to the bronchi. It causes bronchodilation, uh, and that is, that is what our goal is. You're not going to have these on very many ambulances, but this spacer with that meter dose inhaler, you shoot it into this spacer, and the mist is in there. So if your patient's not coordinated enough to go squirt, breathe, hold, you can pump it in there and then they can breathe the medication through the little mouthpiece down there. That's great for kids and people who just aren't coordinated enough to go hold it. Okay, small volume nebulizer, that is what that little devil is. Uh, like I said, you make a mist. Uh, can also be used with CPAP and BVM. We'll show you how to do that in lab. Uh, rescue inhaler, that's that meter dose inhaler, that bronchodilator. Uh, patient medications, we can assist our patients with proper medications. Uh, medication errors, inappropriate use of a medication. Uh, we, we violated one of the six R's or more than one of the six R's. Uh, if there's a medication error, we need to provide appropriate care to our patient if they suffer an untoward effect because of what we just did to them. Uh, if, and then we no, need to notify medical control. We'll have a protocol for what we do when we screw up, and we will document it thoroughly, thoroughly accurately, and honestly because we are EMTs with integrity. You, if you hide it, it's going to show up anyway. You're going to have to refill your meds on your ambulance, if nothing else or your patient all of a sudden has a weird, weird signs and symptoms that don't go with their problem because you gave them medication and tried to hide, hide it. You just, I would say man up, but we have women too. So either woman up or man up, cowboy up. There you go, little cowboy up, and we're going to face the music, and we're going to take good care of our patient, and then we're going to deal with what comes our way. That is that. Tell you what, stand up and stretch while I load this next PowerPoint because I am going to cover shock thoroughly in 45 minutes because I can. If only I could make that go away. Oh, go away, leave me alone. share screen to oh, man. shock that's not getting bad news and oh I'm so shocked uh, there's a type of shock that maybe comes from that shock we've been talking about it off and on all semester it's hypoperfusion not delivering oxygen and nutrients to body tissues it's inadequate perfusion of an organ at the same time not moving out carbon dioxide and waste products. Uh, our body in the early phases of shock 
attempts to maintain homeostasis. How? With the fl fight or flight mechanism, uh, we, uh, you have increased heart rate, increased contractility. Why is all this happening? The adrenal gl glands cut loose adrenaline and it has beta one, beta two alpha properties. What do we get? We get an increase in the rate and contract contractility of the heart. So that pump gets fired up. It increases our cardiac output, just like we talked about earlier. Stroke volume is higher and the rate is higher. So cardiac output goes up. We have bronchodilation, so more air, oxygenated air can get through and we can exhale more air. And then we have peripheral vasoconstriction that is the alpha effects of adrenaline. Those are compensatory mechanisms. They compensate for the drop in blood pressure. Baroreceptors, think of barometer pressure. Baroreceptors sense the drop in, in blood pressure and that triggers the release of the hormone called adrenaline and that brings about the, the those that, that engages the compensatory mechanisms to try to maintain homeostasis. Shock can be caused by trauma. It can be caused by, by medical conditions. Have to have oxygen and nutrients all the time. Have to be carrying away carbon dioxide all the time. That is good perfusion. With poor perfusion, tissues aren't getting oxygen, not moving carbon dioxide away, you have dangerous buildup of waste products. What waste products? We have our body, the body switches to anaerobic metabolism. You start to have lactic acid buildup. That causes lactic acidosis. Not getting oxygen. First, you're going to see a change in the level of consciousness because your patient's brain is not being perfused. The oxygenation to the brain decreases, level of consciousness diminishes, or your patient gets agitated, they get combative. If your patient suddenly becomes combative, we need to first look to see if our patient is hypoxic. Uh, it may not be that they just got mad at us. We, they may have a condition that can kill them. They may be poorly perfusing their brain. So uh, another cause would be hypoglycemia, that the other thing that the brain has to have, has to have oxygen and glucose. It can't store either, so it starts to, those brain cells start to be insulted and then die quickly. Uh, your textbook says the definition of shock, first is a state of collapse and failure of the cardiovascular system that leads to inadequate circulation. Oddly enough, it's life-threatening. What do we do about it? We have to recognize it immediately and we have to treat it immediately and we have to provide rapid transport of these patients. We talked about the perfusion triangle briefly in pharmacology chapter. The perfusion triangle requires a properly functioning pump, intact set of pipes or the vessels uh, blood vessels, arteries, and then the appropriate amount of fluid, blood, and those three things are the perfusion triangle. That is what's required all the time. Different types of shock result from problems with one of these three things. That is the cardiovascular system, including the lungs, oxygenation in the lungs, that circulation through the heart, and then systemic circulation all the way up to that little pinky toe in that earlobe. Perfusion triangle again. That's it's the properly functioning heart, properly functioning container, properly proper amount of fluid. If there's a problem with one of them, we need to recognize it and if possible, treat it and appropriately engage additional resources if needed and get definitive care for our patient. Hypovolemic shock, low, not have, losing blood so that so our patient uh, is in shock, 
that is a cert that comes from trauma that is a surgical disorder a surgical disease all we can do is buy time and treat symptoms and apply skinny pedal on the right therapy need to beat feet to the hospital and get some care for our patient okay blood pressure you know what systolic blood pressure is you know what diastolic blood pressure is pulse pressure is the difference between the two perfusion we'll learn later is there's a formula that gives us the mean arterial pressure uh, and we'll teach you to calculate that uh, what that does is gives us that gives us a good picture of the amount of perfusion to organs and i will tell you now that it takes a map of 60 millimeters mercury to perfuse organs and if it's below that we need to fix it so it doesn't just work off of blood pressure blood flow through the capillary beds regulated by the capillary sphincters those are under control of the autonomic nervous system they react to extrinsic factors like heat and cold uh, Perfusion, we know what perfusion is. It requires a working cardiovascular system, plus an adequate supply of oxygen in the lungs for that gas exchange that we've been talking about. Ad nauseum, right? Good old Latin terms for till, I've talked about it till it makes you want to puke, right? That sounds better to say ad nauseum. All right, and we're recording, so we wouldn't want to say puke and stuff like that, all right. Adequate nutrients in the form of glucose in the blood have to have the, the building blocks that it takes to provide perfusion to tissues, we have to have those available, oxygen and glucose, otherwise we don't have adequate perfusion. And then adequate waste re removal. We have to be moving that circulating, have sufficient circulation to move the carbon dioxide and other waste out or our patient's gonna have problems. The hormone that is triggered, the, the principal hormone that's triggered by falling blood pressure is adrenaline, and that's released by the adrenal glands, and we already have established that it causes an increase in the heart rate, strength of cardiac contractions. Together, that increases cardiac output, right? That's a good thing if we need to compensate for, for lack of perfusion, right? We're, pumping out more oxygenated blood. That's great. Our patient needs that. We do other things to help them out with that. And peripheral vasoconstriction. We made the pipe smaller so the pressure in the system goes up. That's cool, right? All right. Causes of shock. We have an inadequately functioning pump. We have poorly working vessels. The pipes ain't working, right? We're in... in, in the good old West Texas lingo, and we don't have, or we don't have enough fluid. Okay. Uh, what causes pump failure? Cardiogenic shock from the damage from uh, a heart attack, so that part of that heart muscle died significant enough that that it decreases, let's say, the output of the left ventricle. It doesn't pump out enough blood anymore. We'll learn in the cardiac chapter uh, to how to how to differentiate between left pump, left heart failure, right heart failure, what the signs and symptoms are, and how our treatment differs uh, reg depending on which one they have. Cardiac tamponade, blood in that pericardial sac around the heart that keeps filling filling that sac up to the point that it compresses to the, the heart to the point that it can't refill with blood and that dumps the cardiac output. You don't have a full supply of blood in there so that during systole, you have sufficient stroke volume to perfuse the body. Tension pneumothorax, as I talked about the other day, air accumulates within the thoracic cavity over time. If that's significant enough, you can start to have that mediastinal shift. Remember I said it compresses that lung to the point that it starts to push it over toward the other side, away from the injury, and the air continues to accumulate. 
and that starts the mediastine. And remember, it contains the heart, the great vessels, trachea, and the esophagus. And it starts to cause that mediastinal shift. It starts to push over. Now it affects the other lung. It's compressing it. So the amount of available oxygen to our patient goes down because their tidal volume goes down. Why does it go down? Because the space that we want the inhaled air to go is occupied by external air that compresses that space, and now it can't expand when the air comes in. So tidal volume has been decreased, therefore minute volume goes down, right? Okay, you know those things. Poor vessel function. That's distributive shock. What causes that? Septic shock, a systemic infection. It's overwhelming, and the toxins from that infection affect the uh, affect the the affect the the arteries in the body, and those toxins cause massive vasodilation. I wanted to go into too much detail there. We'll have a bunch of that in a later chapter, but bam, you have almost instant massive vasodilation and holy crap folks we don't have enough fluid to fill this up anymore so what happens to perfusion we're not returning enough blood to the heart to be circulated so we uh, that impacts the ability to fill up the system and raise the the pressure enough to perfuse the to perfuse the organs of the body, and our patient uh, deteriorates rapidly. We'll spend a whole bunch of time on that later. Have to be able to recognize that. Then neurogenic shock, uh, that's, uh, think of possibly a head injury or uh, like a, a severe spinal fracture that is significant enough that it just transects that spinal cord, all those, all that bundle of nerves in the spinal cord, they're just sheared in half, and that causes, that can cause massive vasodilation. Again, we don't have enough fluid to fill up the container, and perfusion goes in the dumper, we'll say. Anaphylactic shock. An allergic response causes massive vasodilation. And again, we have that same problem with perfusion. Psychogenic shock, see something horrible, hear something horrible, get bad news. Your three sons were shot and killed in the war. Uh, I mean, that kind of stuff happened, especially back in World War II. Send off four sons to war, three of them die. If you've ever seen Saving Private Ryan, you've seen how mom, she sees the, the car drive up, and it's obviously a, a military vehicle and a chaplain, and, and two officers get up, and they get out, and they're walking up to the door, and then that bad news is delivered. Your three sons are dead, and she falls to her knees, and she just almost loses consciousness, <clears throat> emotionally overwhelmed. And for some reason that I'm not smart enough to explain, that can cause in some people massive vasodilation that results in a syncopal episode. Why do they pass out or have that syncopal episode? They don't have enough fluid to fill up the container, and that causes an instant drop in blood pressure. The brain isn't perfused, so level of consciousness goes from conscious and alert to unresponsive like pow, and now they are unconscious, and then maybe they, they suffer trauma in the fall because they fall and hit something. So that is the picture I want you to have in your heads about psychogenic shock. I hear medics and all the time make fun of it. Uh, they, they're so bad that they could never, so tough, have that hard shell. They can never suffer psychogenic shock, or people just make that crap up. It can't be real. They're just trying to get attention. No, it's a real thing. And if you picture poor Private Ryan's mom getting that news that three of her sons are dead and her fourth one is still gone to the war, and bam, have that massive vasodilation, and down she goes. It's a real thing. All right. 
Get off that soapbox. I have my little pet peeves, and that's one of them, because I just get, excuse me, but pissed when I hear people make fun of psychogenic shit. There are people who, who, who fake feigning all the time, but there is real psychogenic shock. All right. Low fluid volume, hypovolemic shock. The sticky red stuff is leaking out, and blood pressure drops because of it. Uh, that's hemorrhagic shock. There is non-hemorrhagic hypovolemic shock. I want you to picture a, a kid who has had 104 fever for three days, uh, have nausea and vomiting, diarrhea, and the kid is so sick, and the parents don't know to take him to the doctor, take her to the doctor, and so throwing up liquids, can't keep liquids down, diarrhea, we're losing more liquids, more fluids are going out, the fever's up, so sweat, 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 we're losing, we're losing volume all around, there's, we can't do anything to reverse that, and over time, because of that, all those, those various mechanisms of losing body fluids, eventually that patient becomes hypovolemic. Uh, you can make that an old person in a hot house because they can't afford to turn on the air conditioner in Houston, Texas in August during a heat wave when it's 100 outside with 98% relative humidity and it's 110 in the house and they don't feel it so they have a sweater on and they don't really like to eat or drink that much anymore. They can't taste it and Bam, man, they could get hypovolemic on you in a hurry. So picture those things as another way to bring about hypovolemic shock. Cardiogenic shock. The old pump ain't working right anymore. Have damage to the pump for some reason. And if it's right heart failure, it caught the damages to the the right ventricle side, then that and it's not going to pump blood out to the lungs like it's supposed to. So blood's not even, it, we have blood accumulating that's not making it into the heart. So it's backing the system up to the point that, that they have peripheral edema. But now we, it's a closed system, right? So we're not getting enough blood returning from the lungs back over to the left side of the heart so that we can move that, that oxygenated blood out so that has that decrease in circulation through that closed system has caused cardiac output to go down. And if it goes down enough, that is cardiogenic shock. It could be that the left ventricle isn't, it's damaged. It's not, you don't get full systole in that left ventricle and it can't keep up with what the right side of the heart's doing so but blood's backing up into the lungs because it's not getting circulated out and again the stroke volume and cardiac output go down therefore perfusion of tissues goes down because we're not filling up the system because the pump doesn't work right okay um, Obstructive shock, let's talk about some of those. We just mentioned them. There's a mechanical obstruction that prevents adequate blood from filling the chambers of the heart. Uh, so we have cardiac tamponade. Just picture that sack around the heart that's not very pliable, and it's supposed to be a potential spacer, not with a little bit of pericardial fluid in it to avoid friction rubbing a hole in something. And but now it's filling up with blood or some other or, or plasma or some other fluid and it fills up, fills up, fills up, and then it starts compressing the heart and the heart heart can't refill. And because it can't refill with the normal amount, the normal number of milliliters of blood, it can't pump out enough blood to maintain perfusion and maintain blood pressure. That's obstructive shock. Tension pneumothorax, we get a kink in the great vessels so that 
we'll call it preload, the blood that returns to the heart to be pumped through the right side of the heart, out to the lungs, back to the left side of the heart. Preload goes in the crapper because the tension pneumothorax has a kink in the in the vena cava so that we're not returning in that that largest vein in the body we're not returning blood to the right side of the heart we have dumped preload therefore blood pressure goes down got that picture all right pulmonary embolism whoa embolism that's a new word that's something let's say a blood clot that that blocks a blood vessel in this case it would be your pulmonary arteries. How does that work? Picture circulation through the heart. Blood goes to the right atrium. It goes through tricuspid valve to the right ventricle. And then the, the right ventricle in systole ejects blood, deoxygenated blood, through the pulmonary arteries out to the lungs. But what if a big blood clot had broken loose in the leg and it comes up makes it through the femoral artery it hits the inferior vena cava it makes it up into the right atrium into the right ventricle it gets pumped out and it gets out into a pulmonary artery or arteries and it's too big to keep going and it forms a dam it blocks the blood from flowing out to that lung and through capillary beds of the alveoli, that whole thing we've been doing over and over. Therefore, that blood isn't returned back to the left side of the heart. Oh, we've done a couple of things here. We have decreased the available blood for our left ventricle to eject. Therefore, blood pressure has gone down, perfusion has gone down. What else have we done? We have put a dam up to prevent blood from being circulated out to be oxygenated, our patient has two major insults that can kill them right freaking now. RFN, right freaking now. It's a real thing because I'm not going to say anything else that starts with the F. That's uh, all right. Pulmonary emboli, they are very serious. And you can have a saddle embolus that, that plugs two pulmonary arteries. It's so big. And then you have a great big problem. So these are serious things. So I'll teach you how to recognize them, recognize them, how to try to treat them until we can get them to the hospital and they can get definitive care for that. Sometimes surgical care, sometimes go to the cath lab and they can remove that thing. Uh, sometimes it's small enough they can just dissolve it with blood thinners. All right, distributive shock. Widespread dilation of those small, small arterioles, small venules, or both. So what was that? We've already, we've, man, we've nailed this. We've got ahead, didn't we? Septic shock, neurogenic shock, uh, that damage to the, to the spinal cord or to the brain. Uh, anaphylactic shock, that, that horrible allergic reaction that causes massive vasodilation. What do all four of these things have in common in distributive shock? You can't distribute it, can't distribute adequate amounts of, of oxygenated blood to perfuse tissue because the pipes got too big and we don't have enough fluid to fill up the pipes. So that septic shock, neurogenic shock, anaphylactic shock, psychogenic shock. Hypovolemic shock, we don't have enough fluid to fill up the system anymore. Why don't we have enough fluid? There's bleeding somewhere or there is just prof profound dehydration for some reason. Man, we don't ever think of this one. Uh, respiratory insufficiency. So if I tell you, you need to immediately engage positive pressure ventilation in any patient who has signs and symptoms of dyspnea and signs of shock. Well, I took the blood pressure, it's not low. I guess there's not a sign of shock. Oh, how about your patient's altered level of consciousness? So 
if they have dyspnea and altered level of consciousness, we're going to treat them as if they have respiratory failure and we are going to oxygenate them. We're going to bag them, positive pressure ventilation, get the maximum amount of oxygen down to the alveoli, into the bloodstream, so we can flood the bloodstream with oxygen molecules. So we fill up all that hemoglobin and we try to reverse our patient's condition. Anemia, oh my gosh, we don't have enough red blood cells anymore. Our patient has, they have a blood cancer that affects red blood cells. Oh man, that's anemia, right? Uh, they, we have a patient who has a slow GI bleed and it's, they slowly bleed over time. They just feel weak and tired, real, oh, horribly weak and tired. Why? Because they don't have enough red blood cells. Why are they weak and tired? They don't have enough red blood cells left to properly carry oxygen molecules on the hemoglobin to, out to perfuse the body. So uh, that's why you feel tired and run down with anemia. Oh man, just don't have any energy. Why? I'm not getting perfused. All right. Uh, certain types of poisoning, carbon monoxide. Remember, I told you 300 carbon monoxide has, or the, no, let me say it right. Uh, hemoglobin has a 300 times greater affinity to attach carbon, di carbon monoxide molecules to that hemoglobin that does an oxygen molecule. So that is that really creates a type of shock because perfusion goes to crap, right? All right. So we have to treat that with we have to flood them with oxygen so that when a carbon monoxide molecule comes off of the hemoglobin, bam, there's an oxygen on it. Another one comes off, bam, there's an oxygen on it. And we have to do that until we start to reverse this carbon monoxide poisoning. Cyanide poisoning inhibits the attachment of oxygen molecules to hemoglobin. So that is a type of respiratory shock because perfusion can't be maintained due to a problem with either not having enough red blood cells with hemoglobin, as in the last slide, or having something that interferes with the attachment of oxygen molecules to hemoglobin. All right, you got the picture. Let's talk about stages of shock. We're scooting fast through this. Stages or progression of shock. We have compensated shock. Remember, I talked about have that drop in pressure, bam, Re adrenaline is re released from the adrenal glands. That is the principal hormone. It, and we have this compensatory mechanism engaged. Heart rate and contractility go up. The, we have bronchodilation. We have peripheral vasoconstriction. What happens? That peripheral vasoconstriction. Oh crap! My old, my old pulse oximeter doesn't work anymore. Why? Peripheral vasoconstriction has shunted or displaced blood back into central circulation for the perfusion of organs. So the extremities feel cool. They get pale and that pulse oximeter does not work right anymore. That's why I tell you in tidal CO2, that measurement of that last little volume of exhaled air, how much CO2 is in that? Is it between that 35 and 45? We know perfusion's looking good. If it goes way down, we know perfusion is way down. Okay. Decompensated shock, you can only compensate for so long. You only have so much adrenaline. The body can only fight the fight for so long using that fight or flight mechanism. And then it gets tired and it starts to quit. And that's when blood pressure falls. Blood pressure, because of the compensatory mechanisms, falling blood pressure is a late sign of shock. We don't see that until they've decompensated we're way down the road. They are in deep weeds. They are about to die. And if something isn't done to deal with that, as we have progression of shock to the point that perfusion 
the lack of perfusion has damaged multiple organs. We have multiple organ failure. Then we have irreversible shock. How do we know whether our patient is in decompensated shock or they've hit irreversible shock when we're EMTs, advanced EMTs or paramedics? We don't. It takes lab work. It takes all kinds of, it takes uh, lab values. It takes uh, monitoring to determine whether that patient has hit irreversible shock. We won't know that. We might have an idea if it just looks flat, looks dead on us, uh, maybe, but we don't know that. I just want you to know that mainly compensated and decompensated shock and and that we need to treat these patients quickly. We need to transport them quickly. Uh, and then irreversible shock is when they're just dang near dead. They have multiple organ failure and you're just waiting for things to play out. Uh, again, I said blood pressure is maybe the last measurable factor to change in shock. Okay. Uh, kids, and by that I mean infants and children, they, their compensatory mechanisms are fantastic and they compensate extremely well and they compensate, compensate, compensate. And then it's just like they fall off a cliff and die on you because their, their compensatory mechanisms fail. Whereas adults have more of a slow slide as, as they decompensate the kids, they just, Man, they, they go fast, and we'll talk a lot more about that later. But I want you to know you need to get on your horse and take care of those infants and kids really fast just because their blood pressure hasn't dropped doesn't mean anything because by the time that happens, they go into cardiac arrest. They don't just have a blood pressure that falls, the heart rate that keeps going up, and a respiratory rate that keeps increasing. Okay. Uh, when do we expect shock? Uh, patient with multiple severe fractures, with abdominal or thoracic injuries, spinal injuries, severe infections, major heart attacks, anaphylaxis. All right. Uh, you can look at this slide when I post the PowerPoint later this afternoon. Uh, we always tell you to, to consider that your patient has suffered a loss of at least one liter of blood adult patient, one liter of blood per fractured femur. Uh, this came from a medical school text and they allow for up to possibly two liters of blood per fractured femur. So we'll spend a lot more time on that later. I told you pelvic fractures are, there's potential for massive blood loss. Yeah, 1.5 to 4.5 in an adult, holy smokes. If there's six liters of blood, and I'm going to tell you that most adults don't have a full six liters of circulating blood volume, but we use that as a rule of thumb. Well, two liters is a third of that. That's a massive blood loss. 4.5 is dang near all of it, right? Okay. Keep on moving. We're doing good. So how do we know to start looking for this stuff? We're going to, man, remember back there? The reason I stress patient assessment so much and your patient assessment algorithm is mechanism of injury, nature of illness. That's right there at the first. If you have catastrophic mechanism of injury to your patient, you need to hurry up and go and we need to assess for signs and symptoms of shock, right? If your patient is having a major heart attack right in front of you and then we need to watch for signs and symptoms of, of cardiogenic shock. We perform, okay, this just goes through patient assessment algorithm. Watch that level of consciousness. Stay on top of that. If that changes, perfusion has changed. We have to treat it right now. If they have a lower level of consciousness when you get to them on that AFCU scale, and they've had major trauma, giddy up and move and start looking for, for what, what is causing this inadequate perfusion of their brain. All right, we manage life threats, we package quickly, 
and we transport and we do everything else on the road. Any patient who has signs and symptoms of shock gets high flow oxygen. Oh, what if they have COPD and I, and I knock out their hypoxic drive and they don't breathe anymore, then freaking bag them, right? Okay. Hypoperfusion, we're gonna treat that aggressively. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Consider ALS, if they can respond to you quickly or they can meet you on the way because they can infuse some fluids and in some places now uh, administer O negative blood to help hold that hypovolemic volemic patient over until we can get them to surgery. Okay, general impression, are they critical or not critical? Do we have a patent airway? Yes or no? We treat it if they don't. Uh, if your patient's unconscious, we're going to try to see if they'll, if they'll tolerate that oral pharyngeal airway. That's the best way to go. Assess their breathing. Don't hesitate to assign somebody the job of positive pressure ventilations, either assisting ventilations by providing a little more tidal volume where it's insufficient or bagging them uh, at 10 to 12 uh, breaths per minute with 100% O2. Stay on top of their circulatory status. That means their heart rate and their blood pressure. We need to quickly assess them for life-threatening bleeding. We need to look for blood running out from to the outside, and we need to find it, fix it, and don't move on till we fix it, right? That means bleeding out X, exsanguination, become, come, really comes before A, B, C, D, E. So we're going to jump on that. We're going to manage that. National Registry puts this treating blood loss down at the C in your ABCs with circulation. I'm telling you, don't wait. Get somebody on your team managing that hemorrhage and then you continue on with your ABCs, right? That's all right. Uh, determine really quickly if you need a ALS, how fast they can get there, how fast you can package and transport and get that patient to a trauma center because that's where they need to be. Uh, all right. History taking, we may not ever get one. They may have significant enough trauma that we can't get it. Or we may be, they may have a chief complaint of weakness and we determine they're hypovolemic because they've been throwing up and having diarrhea and fever for three days and that's why they're hypovolemic. So investigate that chief complaint. Pain in my right upper quadrant. Wow, when did that start hurting? When I got whacked with a baseball bat. Oh man, uh, you may have a bleeding liver. You may be hypovolemic. I've got to get to work. Get a sample history if you can. If you can't, look for things like a medic alert bracelet. That can give you some clues. Um, secondary assessment. Again, if you find that life threat, you find it, you treat it immediately before you move on. Let's hurry and get someone getting us a ba baseline set of vitals. You're going to have somebody there almost everywhere who can get that baseline set of vitals while you're doing your primary assessment and while you have somebody who is managing that massive hemorrhage. You have to be the team leader. You have to be confident, you have to step up, and you have to assign jobs and get people to take care of these things. Reassessment, we have to trend vital signs. We have to, at, with this critical patient, reassess at least every five minutes, and we're gonna record that blood pressure, pulse, respirations, and we're going to look to see if that blood pressure over time is starting to fall. If that heart rate's starting to come up and level of consciousness is start to, starting to go down, then we need, to, we need to be trending that, keeping an eye on that, keep an eye on your interventions. Uh, is that tourniquet, has that thing loosened and your patient's starting to bleed again? I, our tourniquets I don't think are gonna loosen, but maybe somebody didn't get it tight enough. And we got, or we got the tourniquet on there, we got the blood flow stopped, but we got our patient in a supine position. We've done some things for our patient now and their blood pressure has increased and now they start to bleed again because that tourniquet isn't tight enough anymore. All right, stay on top of those ABCs uh, and then monitor that mental status all the time. That is gonna be 
your first indication that perfusion, perfusion is decreasing. Uh, we have to know what interventions are needed. We have to be proficient in those, and we have to be assertive, if not aggressive, in applying those. Uh, keep your patient warm. Keep them hot. Oh, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you uncomfortable. How do I want you to manage your shock patients? Temperature control. It is August in Amarillo, Texas. It's 104 degrees outside in a horribly hot afternoon, and you have somebody who's bleeding internally. They're in hypovolemic shock. I want you to put a blanket under them. I want you to put a blanket over them, and I want you to turn the heater wide open in the back of your ambulance. That's how warm you need to keep your patient because if you allow them to become hypothermic, if their core body temperature gets low, that interferes with that clotting cascade, and they will they'll bleed out on you in a hurry. So that's you need to have an extra shirt with you because you want it hot enough in there that you need to change your uniform after you're finished because you look like you just climbed out of a swimming pool. Follow standard precautions. You have to protect yourself. You have to control external bleeding. Aggressively open and manage that airway. We have to take care of C-spine just because our patient from this big car crash is obviously in hypovolemic shock and dying right in front of us doesn't mean that we don't get a cervical collar on them, immobilize them on a backboard, manage that C-spine. Don't let them drink anything. They may be going to surgery. Nothing by mouth. They're going to be thirsty. Their body wants fluids because they're losing fluids. Are they? And they, their body feels the need to replenish them. We can't, we can't let them have anything by mouth. Uh, we're going to provide the maximum amount of, of oxygen. I want your patient on a non-rebreather mask. I don't care what his pulse ox is. If he's in shock, I want him on a non-rebreather mask or her, and I want it hot as blue blazes in the back of your ambulance. Put blankets under him, put blankets over him. Consider ALS really quickly, and then we reassess. Every five minutes, we trend those vital signs every five minutes. I am out of time. Uh, you're free to go. I'm going to finish this out so that I have a full recording and I will get this up on uh, YouTube, uh, on my YouTube channel for you. So you can finish out the lecture. Uh, you can start with cardiogenic shock. I'll finish this. You're free to go. You can hang around if you want. Uh, the heart uh, and cardiogenic shock, the heart can't maintain, uh, can't maintain the cardiac output needed to perfuse the body. Uh, patients in cardiogenic shock should not receive nitroglycerin. Remember, it's a vasodilator. And we further, we dump their preload so the available blood coming back to the right side of the heart, that has to be there or the left side doesn't have what it needs to circulate out to the body. Preload, that is the pressure that's maintained in the in the system before it goes to the right side of the heart. If we dump preload, cardiac output goes to, it suffers because we don't have the blood supply that the left side of the heart needs. Afterload is the back pressure on the system. Think of your diastolic blood pressure. All right. Preload and afterload. We'll spend more time with it later. Uh, cardiogenic shock, if we consider using nitro ever our patient needs it needs uh, systolic blood pressure of at least 100 and no erectile dysfunction drugs within 24 hours or supplements within 24 hours of us planning to administer that nitro to them uh, know the signs and symptoms of cardiogenic shock we'll spend a lot of time on that in the cardiac chapter don't worry that much about them right now we're going to transport these patients in a position of comfort with high flow oxygen. We're going to like expedite transfer, transport, immediate transport, get on the road, you do your secondary assessment en route to the hospital. Consider having ALS meet you on the way. They have a few more golf clubs in their bag. Maybe, maybe we just have a nine iron and a putter and they have 
all the golf clubs that you would need to play a round of golf and their bag of tricks to treat this patient in cardiogenic shock. Cardiac tamponade, I've already talked about it. That sack around the heart is filling up with fluid or blood and that pressure starts to compress the heart so we don't get the refill of the heart so cardiac output goes down because stroke volume goes down. Why does stroke volume go down? Because there's not adequate refill. We're gonna apply high flow oxygen. Surgery is the definitive treatment or at least poking a needle in the pericardial sac and aspirating or sucking out that blood with a syringe. I've done it on dogs. I was cleared to do it on people. I just never had to. Dang it. Uh, cardiac tamponade, you're going to learn a lot about Beck's triad when we do the, the chest trauma chapter. But I threw this in here. We keep talking about JVD, jugular venous distension. And I told you it looks like that, that jugular vein starts to look like it's the diameter of a big thumb popping up on that patient's neck. Look at that. That is jugular venous distension. And then muffled or distant heart tones. You're listening to the heart sounds through thick fluid. So uh, if you ever been under the water in a swimming pool and try to yell to one another and figure out what, what, what the other person said, yeah, sound waves are muffled. They don't travel well through liquid. So same principle, the heart sounds of all the lubs and dubs and all the clicks and clacks of opening and closing valves, that doesn't, you don't get the same sound when you're hearing that transmitted through that thick liquid that's around the heart. And then low blood pressure, it's more than low blood pressure and you're gonna learn a lot more about that in thoracic trauma. Obstructive shock, tension pneumothorax, we've talked about it. Uh, you get that, that big mediastinal shift. It's pushing over to the opposite side. It's compressing everything and it's kinking those great vessels. And that is, that is what, that's decreasing blood return to the right side of the heart. So the left heart, left side of the heart eventually doesn't get the blood it needs to eject to perfuse the body. Consider ALS early in this, the treatment for attention pneumothorax, at least the temporary one, is chest decompression. We take an IV catheter, the needle with the little Teflon, the, the needle is the stylet, the little Teflon catheter, the part that you leave in a vein when you start an IV, you have that, that whole thing, and we call that an IV catheter, and you poke that needle through the chest, and you get a pop and then you pull the, the needle out and then air that's compressing the lung and causing that mediastinal shift starts to escape through that catheter. And then if it quits and they're still symptomatic, we poke another one. And then they look like a backwards porcupine by the time we get them to the hospital, if it's about enough tension pneumo, because they need a chest tube, they need surgical intervention. Unless you're a flight medic these days, very unlikely that you'll be putting chest tubes in. In the old days, back in during my career at AMS, we put chest tubes in in the field. We had a medical control director who felt comfortable with us doing that. Back to that integrity and reputation thing, right? He trusted us a lot to throw his license out there, allow us to cut a hole in somebody's chest and pop in uh, chest tubes so that we could move that air out of that thoracic cavity. Man, how do you treat that as an EMT? I'm gonna tell you positive pressure ventilation. Uh, that's, that's the best you can do till we can, get a, till we can get somebody there to poke holes in the chest. There are places that they train, medical control trains EMTs to do pleural decompressions and allow, and has a protocol that allows that. Uh, think of a little bitty mountain town, up in New Mexico, way back in the sticks, and you have a really aggressive uh, Afghanistan war vet, army veteran doctor who's used to everything being done in the field by his medics, and it's, what do you mean my EMT can't do a plural decompression? 45-minute transport to the hospital, I'm tired of seeing dead people. Let's teach them how to jab a hole in somebody's chest and let that air out of there, and then jab another one and another one and another one. All right. 
uh, hospital management is required for septic shock. That's that massive infection that causes the, so the toxins from the bacteria cause, they release, cause massive vasodilation. Standard precautions, you have to protect yourself. You don't want to catch the funk, right? You don't want to die too. Uh, high flow oxygen, obviously, we're going to give them all the oxygen we can to maybe help buy them some time till we can get them to the hospital. And they can give them some IV antibiotics, hopefully to deal with this before they go into multiple organ failure and die. Uh, it's our job to recognize it and call, it, call a sepsis alert, and then they're ready to go when we get there. All kinds of supportive treatment, uh, things to help maintain the blood pressure, uh, bedside continuous dialysis to keep uh, to remove the toxins that the kidneys normally would. Those kinds of things. Balloon pump in the in the 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 inferior vena cava to boost that, to boost the preload to increase cardiac output, uh, all way above our scope of practice, but those are the things that that patient needs. We need to recognize it. Uh, emergency treatment for neurogenic shock, that patient with the, with the horrible spinal injury or the brain injury that's causing that mass, massive vasodilation. We need to jump on that and treat that. We need to maintain good airway, maintain ventilation uh, and oxygenation. We do that with the BVM connected to oxygen with a reservoir so that we can, we're pumping with, with every breath we give them that each, each tidal volume that we provide has 100% O2 in it or as close as we can get. Of course, spinal immobilization, conserve body heat, make ourselves horribly uncomfortable with the heat blowing in the back of the ambulance while we're working our tails off and it's hotter than blue blazes outside. Welcome to EMS, my friends. Uh, we're going to ensure the most effective circulation possible. Uh, that's difficult. Uh, and then uh, transport promptly, consider ALS. Anaphylactic shock, we have to get on that epinephrine early before they have time to have their blood pressure bottom out. Administering Benadryl to these patients to pro provide that histamine blocker that should be an EMT level drug, it's not. So anyway, we'll spend a lot of time on anaphylaxis in the appropriate chapter. Provide high flow oxygen, ventilatory assistance, uh, consider the fact that your patient who has been stung by a bee and they just have hives all over them, consider the fact that as that toxic substance that was injected into them by that bee sting, as that spreads and worsens, they may suddenly, they may suddenly go into full-blown anaphylactic shock on you as that's absorbed. So consider ALS backup. Uh, that's the cavalry coming with the Benadryl, all right? Uh, psychogenic shock. Uh, usually somebody suffers psychogenic shock episode and then they, uh, and then after they have the syncable episode that goes with it. Then the system recovers quickly and they regain consciousness. Uh, the horrible thing is on the way down, they may bust their head and now they have a closed head injury or they may fall on the sharp edge of a table and impact their liver. And now they have, uh, uh, they're bleeding in their, in their belly because they have a liver laceration and, uh, psychogenic shock. Oh, let's say your patient is in compensated hypovolemic shock. You call for an ALS crew, they get there. And when they start, when they get ready to start an IV on the patient, they have a death, deathly afraid of needles. And they see that IV catheter that's about to be stuck into their arm. And oh man, they have, they suffer psychogenic shock from that, 
and then that compounds the problem of the the hemorrhagic shock and your patient is in a lot worse shape for a time. Okay, how do we treat it? Uh, if they can't walk after the fall, consider something else. There's probably a medical reason. Uh, prompt transport, supportive care, talk to them, reassure them. The human thing, uh, never be too good to hold a little old lady's hand. I don't care if you're a paramedic or a, or a cardiothoracic surgeon, never be too good to hold a little old lady's hand. Uh, that human touch, that reassurance. Now, if they don't want you to touch them and hold their hands, but don't be doing that because then we have assaulted and battered them and all kinds of cruel, horrible things, so don't do that. Uh, all patients with loss of consciousness need to be evaluated by a physician. Their perfusion dropped for a time for some reason, and we need a full assessment. I'm talking a full workup at the hospital to determine why. Hypovolemic shock, control bleeding, keep them warm, like I've already said. Recognize internal bleeding. We can't stop it. That's a surgical disease. We need rapid transport. Do that secondary assessment secondary survey en route to the hospital, rapid transport, safely still, rapid transport, get them to somebody who can do surgery and fix this. That's not us. Obviously, always maintain an airway and provide respiratory support. Uh, respiratory insufficiency, how do we treat that? We treat that with a BVM, maintain an airway with, a, with positive pressure ventilation, uh, supplemental oxygen, I mean, that BVM has to have that reservoir. Uh, it's required by rule by the Texas Department of State Health Services on all certified ambulances, licensed ambulances that you could transport patients. Connect that to your oxygen supply. You checked out your truck that morning. You know you have a full, full M tank of oxygen there on the side of your box, and you turn that on to 15 liters a minute or enough to always keep that reservoir bag inflated with your bag valve mask and then we're going to ventilate that patient. Shock in older patients. Geriatric patients, compensatory mechanisms do not respond as well as compensatory mechanisms in younger patients. What do I mean? Uh, Uh, arteriosclerosis, what used to be called hardening of the arteries, the old arteries, they, they become less pliable, they become more stiff, therefore that those alpha effects of adrenaline don't work as well because we don't get that vasoconstriction like, we, like in a younger patient. So adrenaline doesn't, doesn't do its job as well, so they can't compensate as well. Uh, maybe they have underlying heart disease. They have some damage to their heart from an old myocardial infarction and the beta-1 effects of adrenaline don't work as well because it, it doesn't increase the contractility of the heart as well as it does in a younger patient. Maybe they're on beta blockers like I talked about earlier and that blocks the beta-1 receptors in the heart so that we don't have those, those that the adrenaline, the beta-1 of the adrenaline doesn't bind to that beta-1 receptor. It can't get to it to increase the heart rate and increase the contractility. So that's, that's what you see with shock in older patients. They don't compensate as well. They decompensate and die much more quickly. Other than that, we treat shock the same as we recognize that they're going to go downhill faster. They're going to decompensate faster. We need to get on the stick, provide rapid transport, and consider ALS. We're not gonna spend time playing around on scene just because this is an old person who got dizzy and passed out. We better assess and see if they have shock, if they're in shock. That's all we get of shock for now. Uh, that, is the, that is the end of shock. You will learn much more 
about shock as we proceed through the course. Appreciate you either staying with me or coming back and watching the tail end of this video. Thanks.